Hey guys, how's everyone doing tonight? Hope uh, you guys are having a fairly decent day at the very least, uh, if not a really good one. Um, and I hope you're ready uh, for some comfy corner relaxation uh, time and continuing on with our book, which it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while since we've uh, done more with the book. So. I cleaned my room today and I'm pretty okay with it. I usually try to have my keyboard in my lap during Comfy Corner, but uh, apparently I can't do that with a new computer. Welcome back, Jacob. Okay. But yeah, so we're going to uh, continue reading our book tonight. Um, we might actually... Well, maybe not. We may finish it. We may not. I'm not sure. Got uh, almost 100 pages. We've got about 90 pages to read. But, um, can maybe pull that off. I didn't think we were that close to being done with the book. Excuse me. Hi. Let's go ahead. And pause the music in the background. So, um... I know it's been a few weeks since we, uh, last read from the book. Um, I'm trying to remember what just happened. Pyre doesn't love you anymore. I'm sorry, Jacob. Let's see. So, our group has gone off on, uh, finally gone off on the original quest uh, of um, finding the Meech Dragon Egg. They've uh, they rescued Lee Tu Benz who is uh, now on the mend um, and mostly healed I think. Uh, Kale hatched a new dragon that is a singing dragon named uh, Meta, or Mita. I think it's Mita. Um, and she's a, yes, she's a singing dragon. Uh, and then the group was attacked. Oh, uh, the group was joined by the wizard Fenworth and his librarian, Libretta Wit. Then they were attacked by Blemets. And... The last, uh... Excuse me. Yes, a singing dragon. Uh, the last thing that was said... Um... The... Uh... Wizard, Wizard Fenworth told her, uh, told Kale that she must learn to control her use of light. Which she expressed shock at. So. Alright. <clears throat> Chapter 39. 
It's going to be interesting trying to remember all the voices that I did. Okay. Chapter 39. Mount Turbinvent. Tur Torben Avd. I hope that's not a character whose name I'm going to have to say a lot, because that is a very confusing word. I think it's a mountain, though. Turbin... Turbinot. Maybe it's Turbinot. I don't know. Okay. <coughs> Oops. Kale stomped up the path, grumbling under her breath as everyone at everyone who came to mind. Her night had been filled with bad dreams. She startled the wake at every single or every slight sound. Uh, how is it spelled? It's T O U R B A N A U T. But I thought the U was a V at first. But I think it's Turbinot. Mount Turbinot. That just. That's what it is now. If that's not how it's supposed to be, the author should have made it a more easily pronounced word. Excuse me. Okay. <clears throat> she startled the wake at every slight sound, thinking another pack of blemets was outside her tent. Mita, yeah, Mita had come, had come awake each time, and her soothing voice crooned Kale back into slumber. It's a book. You can pronounce it how you want. Exactly. The first morning, they had bade Zavian goodbye. He would travel back to Glim's homeland and inform the Trio family of their loss, Glim's gain. Glim's gain. After days of flying north, the dragons delivered the questing party to the base. Oh, that's right, Glim, um, one of the um, uh, Kimmins. Glim, one of the Kimmins, uh, died in the Blimid attack. After days of flying north, the dragons delivered the questing party to the base of Mount Torbinot. Their wingspan prevented them from flying into the narrow canyons, and so the large dragons were left behind, with Deshay and Vizi. Labritowit beamed as he came across each additional landmark familiar to his youth. He bubbled with enthusiasm to be back in the land of his birth, but even he could not keep up a running commentary on their surroundings. Just like the others in the questing party, the Trumenhofer had to concentrate on breathing as they tramped up the canyons. The entrance to Dale, the, Trumenhofer, the Trumenhofer's principal city, nestled between two peaks of the same mountain. Cold winds, a spattering sleet, sore feet, and too many questions all plagued Kale's peace of mind. The moonbeam cape warmed her body, but her cheeks and nose felt like ice. Her fine boots rubbed against her toes and heels and made her limp. The worst part of going on a quest is the walking, and not knowing where you're going, and having cheerful people surrounding you who don't seem to realize the danger behind us. She thought of poor Glim and the hideously beautiful Blimits, attractive even in death. She glanced over the edge of the path and realized a drop-off had formed while she trudged along. She had better watch her step, and quit stomping, lest she cause the nearing ledge to crumble. Danger beside us? Learc said they would reach Labritowit City before nightfall, but unless the guard recognized the wizard's librarian straight off, they would probably have to camp until morning, when the Trumenhofer would go through the gates alone and secure a pass for the rest. And danger before us. Once they gained entrance admittance to Dale, they would briefly visit Labritowit's family. Then, the Trumenhofers would provide a guide to take them deep into the mountain, beyond where their people built towns. The questers would pass into territory where Risto's henchmen had taken up residence. Fenwar said there was a barrier of some sort that they would have to break through. But when Kale asked who had built the barrier, the Trumenhofers or the enemy, Fenworth hemmed and hawed and changed the, changed the subject. He's not very good at answering questions. Lee Tu Ben's voice startled Kale. What's the matter, O Rant Girl? Nothing. You look angry. I'm not. 
We two said nothing, but walked directly behind Kale, until they reached up a wider spot in the path. The Immerlindian lengthened her stride to come up beside Gale. Kale. You're limping, Li Tu said. Why don't you let Jim heal you? Jim is little more than a baby. He worked hard after the Blimit attack. He deserves to rest. Li Tu shrugged. Stubborn. She muttered, but Kale heard her. What? A, com a comment upon immaturity. Kale narrowed her eyes and turned her face to the wind. You're mad, said Litu, because Finworth won't answer your questions. You won't answer my questions either, and Paladin didn't answer my questions. He didn't? Well, yes, he showed me things, but that was a long time ago. Litu hummed the chorus of one of Dar's fav- oh, I'm sorry, Litu hummed the chorus of one of Dar's favorite marching songs before she spoke again. To demonstrate her anger, the young Orant girl resorts to sullen behaviour toward her comrades, grumbling against her leaders and stubbornly refusing help. Kale said nothing. Immaturity, said the Emerlandian. Kale stopped and faced Leetu. Yes, all right, I'm immature. I'm tired, confused, frightened, immature. There! Does that help any now that I've agreed with you? Leetu nodded and Kale resisted the urge to give her a hearty shove. You are still putting one foot in front of the other, Kale. Leetu stepped around a boulder in the path. She looked back at Kale and gestured for her to come on. Give yourself credit for not giving up. You haven't slowed down our expedition, and you've been a valuable member. Most of the time, I don't even know what I'm doing. Leetu chuckled. Chuckled. Most of the time, I don't know what I'm doing. My advantage is more experience. Many times I know what is expected of me, and I do that, whether I am confident of success or not. Kill allowed me to, to go first as the trail narrowed and rose steeply, but came up next to her again as soon as there was room for the two to walk side by side. Litu offered Kale a long, thin breadstick and took one from her pocket for herself. As for being confused, you know what you're to do now. You ought to follow Da, who is just ahead of you. You trust him to be following Shimmerin. I want to know if I made that light thing in the sky, and if I did, how? Penrith won't tell me anything. He's a very old man, Kale, and probably tired. This quest is asking a lot of him. Have some patience and more compassion. Work to make things easier for him, not harder. But he's a wizard, Kale protested. And you think wizards have endless strength, endless knowledge, the answers to everything, and the means to fix all troubles? Kale thought about Li Tu's words. After a minute, she answered reluctantly. Yes. Li Tu did not speak up. Kale sighed. I suppose this is another instance where what I don't know is greater than what I do know. It's hard to unlearn falsehoods. But Paladin knows you can, or he wouldn't have entrusted you with this quest. The ledge topped a bluff, and to their left stood a small wood of majestic evergreens. Beyond that, another cliff rose sharply toward the sky. Excuse me. Hmm. Frightened, Lee Tu continued. Well. It is a lie to face scary things and pretend you're not frightened. Just as it is deceitful to look at the beauty of that scene, she nodded toward the mountain range, and pretend the grandeur does not still your soul, and perhaps not false, but folly, to take in with the eyes and deny with the heart. The Imrelindian paused and gazed with wonder at their surroundings. Then she turned her attention back to Kale. Immature. You've heard Dar say that I am young. I am certainly no Granny Noon, but when you beat back that pride that wants to say, I'm big, then you are in the position to learn. Kill had an image of a little Marion, Dubby Brummer, with his dimpled fists planted on his broad hips, a pout on his face, and one foot about to stamp the ground. How often had she taken care of the troublesome toddler, who always wanted to do what the big children did? The image of his grubby, stubborn face made Kale laugh. The path narrowed again. Put your hood up, said Leetu as she fell behind. 
and the veil over your face, O rapt girl. They crossed the small mountain meadow and started up another incline. The wind calmed and a few flakes of snow drifted lazily around the travelers. Kale looked ahead. Learc led them. Shimmerin and Dar followed. She held the fourth position. Behind her, Litu helped Libertowit climb over a fallen tree. Brunstetter and a clump of brushwood hid Wizard Fenworth and Cecil. Kale caught her breath and looked again to the front of the line and to the back. Her eyes swiveled to look at the mountain pass. Boulders, trees, a cliff in the distance, gray light as the clouds holding snow obscured the sun. The mural in the tavern. Even the details of clothing matched exactly the figures in the picture. This, this scene she walked in was the scene depicted of the members of the seven high races crossing a mountain passage. Kale had seen it every day of her life. She dusted it. She even wiped ale from the surface when a careless customer had swung his full mug too heartily. Kale looked back, just as the old wizard and the tiny Kimmon came ac around the bend. Now the picture differed from the painting on the wall. But even the brushwood that had hidden the last two members of their quest was in the picture in River Away. She'd always thought the Brotherhood of Travelers looked eager to face their adventure. She felt tired and weary, eager to find a warm bed. Who had painted the picture? Master Miger said it was a traveling man who paid for his meal and board by drawing the art upon the wall. She scurried to catch up with Dar. Maybe he would have an idea. Around yet, an yet another twist in the trail, she found those ahead of her had stopped. An old Orant woman dressed in shabby attire stood bent and shivering before Lee Ark. I've waited so long. Her scratchy voice carried a note of pleading. Kale felt uncomfortable. Why did Learc look so formidable? Did he have to look angry, as if he would, at any moment, raise his heavy hand and beat the poor ragged soul? One old woman cannot endanger them. Surely their leader should be more hospitable. Kale clenched her fists under the moonbeam cape, fighting an odd tremor flowing through her body. The old woman bobbed her head. We knew you were coming. A wizard, paladin's choice warriors, and the Orant girl, known as the mighty dragon keeper. The old crone held out two mittened hands, cradling a large egg. Her withered fingers poked through the holes of the knitted black yarn. The yellowed egg she held was larger than her head and perched precariously in her shivering hands. Litu, Libertowit, and Brunstetter came up behind Kale and then stopped. "'Who told you we were coming, old woman?' asked Learc. "'A traitor. He said it was important to get the egg to the Orant girl.' Again, the whine in her voice scraped over Kale's brittle nerves. "'Then why didn't he bring it?' Learc snapped. "'Why send an old woman?' "'He didn't want to come on Mount Turbinot. He said the Trumanhoffers had no love for him.' that Risto would know he had carried the egg and come after him. Kale eyed the egg. She didn't feel the draw that she had felt before, the enchantment that urged her to reach out and pick up a dragon egg. Something dark wavered in and out of her mind as she concentrated on the old woman's offering. Learc's low voice sent a shiver down Kale's spine. Why send you to the top of an unfriendly mountain when the autumn weather is no one is so uncertain? Why not send a strong shepherd, a young man? I've lived on this mountain all my life. My father was a shepherd. The old woman snorted. No one else was willing. The trader said he'd taken the egg from someone who'd stolen it from Risto. Wizard Fenworth came up to them and promptly sat down on a rock. He was winded and seemed more interested in opening his flask of water than in the stranger accosting the troop. Labridowit, is that the meat egg? Wrong size, wrong color. I don't trust this woman, Kyle. Leetu spoke up. She got the egg from a bison back, Leark. The woman's head jerked up and she glared at Leetu. Not all people are afraid of those unfortunate ones who have not pleased Risto and have been cast aside. 
Gorad is a traitor and an honest one. He took the egg because he heard rumors that Risto had stolen it, and Paladin wanted it back. But he's had bad dealings with Risto. Who hasn't? He was afraid. Who wouldn't be? Liark broke in. Yet you, an old woman, are not afraid to bring the egg to us. My life is almost over. I came slowly. No one would suspect an old woman to be carrying something of great value. Fear gripped Kale's stomach. She wanted to rush forward and knock the egg out of the unkempt woman's hands. Yet another force told her to run the other way, to order everyone to run. I don't want that egg, said Kale. It has no value. It is evil. The woman stood upright, now m more than two feet taller than Liark. She raised the egg above her head, and a screech tore from her throat. Run! screamed Kale. The woman hurled the egg down to the rock path at her feet. Kale and her comrades jumped away, bolting for shelter. A roar, billowing smoke, and choking fumes erupted as the old woman cackled and shrieked. Kale and Litu ran to Fenworth, still sitting on the rock and drinking from his flask. They each grabbed one of his arms, and between them hauled the wizard back down the trail. He muttered complaints at them. Up, not down. The gate is up. Who is making that hideous noise? Hold oh, on. Let me get my feet under me. Where's my walking stick? Best walking stick I've had in ages. Did we lose it? Launch Pale Defense, thank you for the follow. Glad you're enjoying the stream thus far. I hope you continue to enjoy, and welcome to the dork side. How you doing tonight, Lunchbox? Take your time, Jacob. Just a second. Oh, I'm sorry, lunch pail, not lunchbox. I know these things. <laughs> Chapter 40. Three heads are not better than one. I don't suppose the water spell would work again? Fenrith pulled at his beard. He'd taken his hat off and crumpled it into a wad. No, probably not, agreed the Bridowit. Kale crouched behind the Trimenhofer and a wall of stone. Two bulky boulders protected her and the wizard, and his librarian, from the three-headed monster raging along the mountain path. Kale's eyes darted back and forth between the menacing beast and the two old men. She searched the outside area for the mysterious woman and could not find her. The giant, lizard-like creature paced around in a ponderous circle, preventing any of the travelers from getting past. Fenworth sat at the rear of their little refuge. He continued to stroke his long, gray beard with one hand and clutch his hat with the other. His beard took on the look of the swamp moss, and leaves sprouted from his robes. Fire spell? Too unpredictable. Shriveling. Takes too long. Impatient with their conversation, Kale pulled out her small sword and repositioned herself on her knees so she could peer out beside Labridowit and watch the beast. Her fingers tightened around the hilt until her knuckles shone white. She forced her hand to relax and took several deep breaths. She set about locating each of her comrades. Li Tu had scrambled to a perch above them, beyond the monster's reach. She straddled an odd bush growing out from the cliff and shot arrows down upon the angry creature. They penetrated its skin and stuck out like quills. Brackish blood drizzled from each wound, but the odd but the arrows did not hinder its movements. The beast roared and charged Kale. She and the Bridowit fell back as one of the monster's heads abruptly stopped outside their hiding place. The thing prodded at the boulders with its snout, but the small opening prevented it from thrusting any closer. Kale sucked air into her mouth with a hiss as she tried to pull herself into a shadow as far from the opening as she could get. A long, skinny black tongue flickered out of the mouth 
out of the head's mouth and explored the crevice. The wizard, the Trimmenhofer, and the Oran girl cowered, pressing their backs against the rock wall. In desperation, Kale jabbed their sword and nicked it. The tongue jerked back with a slurping sound, and the head moved away from the shelter. "'One should never,' said Fenrir sternly, "'transport any monster in the confines of an eggshell. Being cramped like that makes it cranky.' Another head hovered over the opening in the rocks near Kale and the Bridowit. Kale braced her feet apart in a fighting stance, took a firm grip on her sword, and sliced deliberately as the tongue snaked in. The end of the monster's tongue fell at her feet and writhed there. With a squeal that did, did not sound a bit like a soldier, Kale backed away from it as if it were a serpent. Labridowit grabbed the ugly thing and threw it out of their hiding hole. This is not a librarian's job, he complained. This has nothing to do with books and research. While Finworth muttered about spells, wet, dry, cold, hot, Kale peered over the boulders, trying to locate the other members on their quest. One monster head moved close to a ledge littered with small boulders. A sudden flash of light sent it snapping back. At least one Kemen is in there. Kale saw the, th the third head plunge downward. She screeched as Learc darted from one rock to another. Hideous teeth snatched at his back. Dar's trumpet blasted the air. At that precise moment, Brunstetter jumped out and drove his longsword into the monster's neck with beneath the jawbone. All three beast heads howled. The wounded one continued to bellow. Then that head and neck fell limply to the ground. Now as the monster moved, it had to drag the lifeless portion along. Fenworth had risen and crouched behind Kale. No more heroics, she heard him mind speak to them all. Just be patient a minute. I've almost got a handle on this clarification spell. It's about time. The thought sprang up in her mind, and she jerked around to see if it had been heard by the old wizard. His frown seemed to be for his concentration on the deed at hand. He didn't seem to notice her at all. Kale breathed a sigh of relief, but none of the tension left her body. The beast still trudged back and forth, and it knew where each of the members of the quest hid. Frustrated, it growled and made passes at the rocks with the two remaining heads. One head came at Kale again, and she backed up, raising her sword. Instead of flicking its tongue into the space above the boulders, it rammed its massive head against the rocks. The blow shook their little stronghold. Dirt and grit showered down on them, covering their clothing and hair with dust. Kay looked over to see Labridowit and Fenworth whispering to each other and casually brushing dust off their heads. She gritted her teeth. Will we have that spell ready in time? The creature moved off toward the Yark's sheltering rocks. Kale watched. The third head dragged the ground. The beast stumbled and struggled. His movement seemed more encumbered than just from the fallen head. His tail is turning gray. She reported to the men behind her. The Bridowit what rose to spy over the boulders. It's turning to rock. Good job, Finn. But how about starting at the other end? It would be nice to have those disgusting heads turned to stone first. Fenrith ran his hand over the top of his head. Kale noticed for the first time a bald spot right on the crown, surrounded by the long fringe of gray hair. The wizard's fingertips made circular motions on the exposed scalp. Let's see. That would require a number of adjustments. Yes, it could be done. Never mind, said the Britwit. The process ceased while you were contemplating the change. Just go on. The beast will quit moving as soon as you get to the legs. The Bridowit gave a yelp of approval. That's the way. That last bit charged up the remainder of his tail. He's hauling around the city, a city building's worth of stone on his backside. Hoops, that seems to have irritated the fellow. Two rowers com competed in ferocity. One of the heads reached over and nipped the other. Kale held her breath as she watched the hind legs pause, stiffen, and then change color from green to gray. "'Be a little quicker, will you, Finn?' said the Britowit. "'That thing is going to suffer now.' 
He turned his head away. Right, said Wizard Fenworth, and closed his eyes to concentrate. Kale turned away, too. Then she covered her ears as the beast moaned. She welcomed the silence a moment later and looked back to the mountain path. A stone statue stood with one hand, one head hanging over the cliff edge. The two upright necks twined around each other and bent back along the creature's spine. Dar, Learc, and Brunstetter cautiously came out of their hiding places. Litu began her descent, and the Kimmon skittered across the open space to stand with Kale as she emerged. Well then, Fenrith climbed awkwardly over the rocks. Learc and Kale moved to help him. Excuse me. He crammed his hat back on his head and dusted off his robes. Then he slapped his palms together, knocking off the dirt. That was an uncomfortable situation. Warned you, didn't I? Quests are quite interesting, except for the uncomfortable parts. I don't suppose that unpleasant woman is still here? He looked around, even stretching to stand on his toes and peer beyond the monster. A female wizard. Didn't recognize her, but I suspect she was the Burner Stocks woman. Married Crim Copper. Beastly wizard. Can't say they get on. They get along at all well. The others began to move. Kel felt as if she had awakened from a bad dream. A giggle bubbled up in her throat. <laughs> and she repressed it, knowing the others would count it for what it, for just what it was. Nerves. She watched as Leetu picked up the few arrows that had bounced off the monster when it was still alive to threaten their lives. The arrows stuck in the hide were stone now. Dar rejoiced that his pack had not been trodden upon. Brunstetter and the Kimmons quickly gathered more of the scattered belongings and brought them to the wizard. My walking stick! With one finger, Fenworth patted Cecil on the shoulder. Thank you, my dear. He glanced up at the monstrous statue. You know, I really think we must be going. I can't remember if this spell holds or not. Kale had no problem with clearing out of the vicinity of the solidified creature. Learc again took the lead, and the rest followed. Minutes later they heard a grinding crunch, and then a massive shudder vibrated under their feet. Crumbles, said Fenrith. I remember now. Crumbles. Good thing we weren't standing under it. Wait, you are going to have to explain to your kin kinsmen why one of their mountain passes is now filled with rubble. Should sit better with them, coming from one of their own. Right, said the Trumanhofer, nodding his head and glowering. Perhaps you could write a history of the occurrence, suggested the wizard. I'm a librarian. I read books. I don't write. Hmm. Well then, tut tut, I could. I'll see to it, Fenworth. Chapter 41 City of Dale The path widened as it joined another mountain trail. The snow fell in earnest. The sun had been behind clouds for hours, and now the gray light grew darker. The veil of loosely woven moonbeam cloth over Kale's face protected her from the chill and aided her ability to see. But as the afternoon faded into night, she began to worry about losing their way in the mountain passes. Not much further, the Britwit called to his companions. Stay close together, ordered Learc as he moved down the line, checking on each of the trekkers. On his way back to the head of the line, moments later, he repositioned the Kimmons. He sent Shimmer into the front. Cecil walked directly before Kale. Shine, barked Learc as he strode against the quickening wind to the front of the procession. The Kimmons produced a bright yellow light. Even so, Kale barely made out Shimmerin's form, and Cecil's glow cast just enough light to make the path between the Orient Girl and the Doniel visible. The others must be having it harder than I am. I have the Moonbeam Cape. They'd packed heavy winter clothing, 
After the encounter with the woman wizard and the three-headed monster, they had reached an altitude where the wind pressed like icy fingers into their skin. Liark had paused long enough for everyone to put on the extra clothing. The Kimmins, of course, had no need for anything other than their usual light attire. Kale had gracefully, gratefully tucked her feet into extra socks and her hands into mittens knitted by Granny Noon. Not too much farther, Libertuit called again. Kale's feet sank in the snow as it piled higher on the path. Lee Ark tramped back again. Put a hand on the soldier on the shoulder of the person in front of you. This time he brought Brunstetter to walk directly behind Shimmerin, and Wizard Fenworth behind the Urom. The giant walked, shuffling his feet, deliberately clearing a trail for those following. Kale's fingers on Dar's shoulder grew numb. She switched hands, pulling the cold one into the warmth under her cape. Cecil held on to the back of Dar's pant, pant leg. Kale wondered if the little creature was warm, and if her light warmed the back of Dar's leg. Not to watch farther, Libretta repeated. Kale had no warning when they came to the massive wooden doors that made up the gate of Dale. Even standing huddled next to the others with Brunstetter applying his massive fist to announce their arrival, she could see only a dark bulk stretching out of sight to either side. The wind howled, and the snow swirled in a blinding curtain. Only one lantern beside a boarded window in the gate flickered a grudging welcome. The wooden shutter swung back from the gate window. A square of light appeared, and then was blocked by a head bundled in a dark scarf. What? What? The gatekeeper growled. Growled. No admittance after dark. Go to the caves for shelter and come back again in the morning. The shutter started to swing shut, but Brunstetter caught it. His low voice rumbled pleasantly, as if he were explaining to a child some simple matter of curiosity. We've Wizard Fenworth with us, and we're on Paladin's business. That won't work here, grumbled the gateskeeper. His hands, covered in thick gloves, jerked at the edge of the shutter, trying to dislodge it from Brunstetter's massive grip. Here now, let go of that. Go to the guy who's looking a decent citizen and wait for morning. Wizards indeed, using Paladin's name as if it were a password. Shame on you, and let go! The Bredowit pushed to the front. Crap, I hate Trevenhoffers. Not really, but their names. <coughs> Trevithic Bre- Trevithic Re- Hmm. Trevithic Lebretwit here. I'm not interested in sheltering in the caves tonight. Let us in. Wait, wait, you don't say. Bumby Bumblecore here. How have you been, your bookhound? Busy, the Bredowit snapped, and curled. Oh, yes, just a minute. He started to move away from the gate window. Tell your friend to let go. Brunstetter released his hold on the shutter. The square patch of light disappeared. A moment later, the rumbles and groans of gears meshing and grating together signaled that they would be admitted. The noise went on for a long time, before a large door set in a bigger gate swung open. <laughs> hey, Lewis, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing accents. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> Trying to remember which accent goes with which character, though, that's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> but how are you doing tonight, Lewis? Oh, you've got the same mic and arm stand? Nice. I like them both a lot, so... Oh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Getting, uh, continuing on with the book, finally. It's been a few weeks. Um, but... Oh, excuse me. 
It happens. It happens. Yeah, like Jacob says. Just a friendly reminder. But yeah, we're getting towards the end of the book. I think we might be able to finish it tonight. Maybe. Kind of depends. No, no, no. None of that. No banging your head on the wall. It happens. It happens a lot. Don't worry. I don't mind at all. I, I fully understand. No worries, Lewis. Totally understandable. Okay. I need another drink. I will say one thing for the accents. Uh, doing them is makes me really thirsty because it puts just the slightest strain on my vocal cords. And doing it quietly. So. Okay. <clears throat> Brunstetter released his hold on the shutter. The square patch of light disappeared. A moment later, the rumbles and groans of gears meshing and grating together signaled that they would be emitted. The noise went on for a long time before a large door set in the bigger gate swung open. Why would such a simple wooden door require all that ruckus to get it open? Brunstetter stepped aside, allowing Fenworth to enter first, followed by Labridowit and the rest of the party. The Urom had to stoop to get through the entry. Gatekeeper Gatekeeper Bombacor shut the door, abruptly cutting off the sound of the howling wind. Kale threw back the hood of her cape and shook snow from her clothing. She stamped her feet and hoped they all would be they all would soon be someplace where she could put her frigid toes next to a fireplace. Libertowit introduced the gate the gatekeeper. A cousin, he explained. He and Bumblecore did a lot of backslapping and questioning. They asked more questions of each other than they bothered to answer. Ahem. Nope. <clears throat> Old Matt, nope. Ahem. Fenworth, Wizard Fenworth cleared his throat. Mightn't you, mightn't keep your mother... I can read. Mustn't keep your mother waiting, wit. Bumblecore looked startled. Hold on. Glory Tim Domer. Good gravy. Is Glory Tendomer expecting you? Oh, I just saw your father today at noon mail, and I didn't say a thing. Now, isn't that the way of a quest? Fenworth tapped his walking stick vigorously against the stone flooring. Risto knows we're coming. That Burner Stocks woman knows we're coming. Probably that no good husband of hers, Cream Copper, knows we're coming. Even sent out a three headed monster to greet us, but do our people know we're coming? He started muttering and shaking his head, pulling his beard with one hand and knocking newly spreaded leaves to the floor as he did so. Bumbacore paled. Raystor! Burnst stalks! Monster! Fenworth patted the short man on his back. Been bothering you two? Tut tut. We'll have to do something about that. Good cl calcification spell works if you remember her to move briskly afterwards. Emperor Palpatine, do it. <laughs> what? He cleared his throat and gestured to, the, to his librarian. Nice talking to old friends, but we must be going. Gloritendemer makes a good supper, and we don't want to be late. Rude, you know. The Britowit led the way through the wide streets of the stone city. Light rocks shone in a variety of colors along the way. Kale wondered why they were spaced so far apart. The cheery colors brightened dark passages, but were not grouped together to illuminate the entire area. After a while, she grew used to the effect of the subdued lighting, and thought it was a pretty way to brighten the constant gray of the granite. 
Now you see, said the Brittlewit, doffing his hat to those he passed as he went on, instructing his travelling companions. Trommenhoffers don't take granite from the mountain, chip it into blocks, haul it across the country, and stack it into buildings. Such an inefficient way to build a city. Our homes are carved out of the rock. Our streets are not paved, because they are rock to begin with. Therefore, we can spend our time on more worthwhile things. Me too. Yes. What do Trumenhoffers think are worthwhile things to do? Digging. Digging? As in dirt? Sometimes, if you count their extensive agricultural research programs, but more into the way things work. Libretowit digs into books and finds interesting facts. Some Trumenhoffers dig into different ways of doing things. They are more inventors, scientists and scholars among the Trumenhoffers than any other race. In Dale alone, there are six universities. Does anybody need that much learning? The Trumenhoffers do. It keeps them happy. Kayla unbuttoned her cape, and the two dragons scrambled out to sit on her shoulders. They chittered excitedly. Kale caught the gist of what they said by listening with her mind. She grinned as she realized they were saying things she wanted to exclaim herself. Meter and Mita and Jim were uttering, Look at that! Did you ever see? What is that useful? Ooh, that's pretty! Over and over, in different variations of the same odd thoughts. The questing party walked a long, long way before the house fronts began to look like homes, instead of stores and inns. The Trumenhofer guide quit talking as he rounded a corner and quickened his pace. Down the street, a door flew open, and a stout woman rushed out. She trotted to meet them and embraced Libridowit. Mama! he exclaimed, and enveloped her in a big hug. A man appeared and joined the hug, adding slaps on Libridowit's back and exclaiming, "'Well, well, welcome, son!' Neighbors poured out of the nearby homes and gathered in the street. Kale stood back and watched. This was unlike anything she had ever seen. Marion's did not display their affections. These Trumenhoffers spent twenty minutes greeting each other and making introductions. They laughed and hugged. The Bridowitz father, Gruntrig. These names, though. Um, the Bridowitz father, Gruntrig, took over the introductions once his son had led him around and made known the names of each of his companions. Gruntrig introduced Kale to a young Trumenhofer girl named Estebrit, Estelebrist. She pulled the Orant girl around to meet at least fifty neighbors, relatives, and friends who had come over from the surrounding streets. Finally, the visiting travelers were escorted to the house. Kale sank into a soft cushion next to the wall. Dar lowered himself beside her. Would it be rude to take off my boots? She asked the Daniel. My feet ache. Not a bit. You've been accepted as an honored guest. Honored guests can take their boots off? Most definitely. Kale pushed the cape off her shoulders and let it fall behind her, then went to work on her boots. With double socks beneath, they seemed determined to remain on her feet. Damn names, right? Dar braced himself and helped her tug. Then Kale returned the favor and marveled at how comfortable she felt with Adoniel after all this time together. In River Away, no one would have helped her remove her boots. Not that she'd ever had any. She would have been ordered to assist Dar. As they'd settled down again, she grinned at him, just because it was good to have a friend. Wizard Fenworth had given the biggest, most comfortable chair had been given the biggest, most comfortable chair next to a cozy fireplace. Brunstetter sat on the steps of a stairwell. The Ark and the two Bens sat at the table with Libridowit and his father. The Kimmins had found a corner where they wouldn't be stepped on as Mistress Libridowit and her daughters bustled around making supper. Libridowit is happy here, said Kale. Trumenhoffers enjoy family. Do you have family, Dar? He nodded and then closed his eyes and leaned his head against the wall. Lots. 
Kale thought about Fenworth's comment about her mother. Could it be true her mother was alive? Could the old wizard know where she was? She almost asked Dar's opinion when she remembered Fenworth also said that talking about her mother would put her life in danger. I want my mother to be alive. I would like to find her. She let her eyes roam over the room, watching the Trimmenhoffers exchange smiles and affectionate pats as they passed. The Bertowitz mother kissed his cheek as, he, as she set a basket of bread on the table. His father gave his wife a hug around the waist. I wonder what it feels like to be part of a family. I think it would be nice. You belong, Kale. Dar's soft voice interrupted her thoughts. You are part of Paladin's Legion. We are your family. Kale gave him a heart gave him a hard look. He still leaned with his head against the wall, his eyes closed. He looked tired and innocent of any mischief. Are you sure you don't read my mind? Positive. You are altogether too predictable to even have to bother. Could you read my mind if you wanted to? Nope. Haven't got the talent. I can only converse with you if you initiate the mind speaking. The Bridowitz sisters brought around bowls of warm, soapy water and towels. They washed for dinner there in the parlor of the Bridowitz home. Kale thought that was a quaint custom. Another sister soon provided each guest with bread on a platter, a steaming bowl, and a spoon. Dar sat up and smiled his most charming smile as he thanked her. Don't eat yet, he whispered to Kale as the Trimmenhofer woman walked away. Grundrig will say a blessing on the meal first. When everyone was served, the father bowed his head and repeated a simple grace. Then he thanked Walder for the company and the pleasure of seeing their son. He added that he and his family were honored to assist in Paladin's plan in any way before them. Kale looked down at her bowl. In the dim light, she could not tell what was in it, although it did smell delicious. What is this? she asked Dar. Trumenhoffers live underground, so it could be roots or mole stew or grubs. He lifted his spoon to his lips and took a slurping sip. Across the room, Leechu's head jerked up and she frowned at the Daniel. Dar ignored her. It's good, Kale. Now it would be rude not to eat what they have put before you. Just enjoy it. What is it? Dar heaved an exaggerated sigh. <sighs> Flatworm soup. Kale bit her lip and looked around the room. No one noticed she wasn't eating. Mita and Jim scurried around the base of the walls, looking for insects. The little dragons liked worms and grubs and things. Would they eat cooked, cooked flatworms? Take a bite, said Dar. He dipped a chunk of bread in the broth and popped it in his mouth. Kale swallowed hard. She would not insult her hostess. She dipped her spoon in the soup and only half filled it. Closing her eyes, she lifted it to her mouth. It did smell good. She tasted it. Her eyes popped open. Onions! Dar laughed. Litu's voice entered Kale's thoughts. I told you he was just like a big brother. He teases even when he's worn out and too tired to sit at the table. Kale grinned across the room, answering Litu's friendly smile with a wink. Just like a brother. I'll have to learn to tease him back. I might be willing to help you with that project. Kale sighed and dipped her spoon in the onion soup. She would like to stay here. But tomorrow they would go on, deep into the mountain, looking for the meat egg, walking straight into Risto's lair. Okay, we're going to take a uh, quick break um, for bathroom purposes, and then we will be right back uh, to continue on with chapter 42.
I didn't see a link, Lewis. Also, I don't really pull up links on the Comfy Corner Day. Uh, just because um, it might not fit in with the Comfy Corner thing. Um, but yeah, the tea pouring was part of the ambient sound. Chicken. Because I definitely turned my mic off. So. Alright. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Okay. So. Oh, goodness. shouldn't be tired. <laughs> Except, I guess I should because it's 1.30, but still. Still. <laughs> Alright. Chapter 42. The Barrier. Blue sky, white clouds, green grass... After half a day of trudging down grey granite tunnels toward the center of Mount Turban Turbinot, Kale wanted sky above her head and grass beneath her feet. She tried to remember that outside the mountain was a frenzied blizzard, and walking was certainly easier within. I don't really want to go questing on the icy slopes of a mountain with a furious wind trying to push me off and hard pellets of snow pounding against me. All right, Jacob, sleep well. Have a good night. Thanks for being here. Uh, I hope you have a very restful sleep. And we'll see you next time. Okay. She looked at the grim walls revealed by the lanterns they carried. I'm certainly not cut out to be a Trumanhofer. Libertowit walked up front of their guide. I'm sorry, up front with their guide. Tilkertinibo Rap Jackaport. Tilkertinibo Rap Jackaport. God damn these names. Good night. Kale found it hard to remember even part of the Trimmenhofer's names. The names for places in the Trimmenhofer Mountain were short. They had, pressed through, they had passed through small towns, Glep, Trass, and Burr. Soon they would reach Fifth, and then a stretch of tunnels where no Trimmenhoffers cared to roam. Fenworth Treadle... Okay, so they name, they name their towns like four-letter words, but their names are Tilkertinibo Rapjackaport. Come on, Trumpet Offers. Okay. Fenworth trundled along in a wooden cart pulled by a burrow. No danger threatened them for this part of their journey, and the old wizard slept most of the time. Dar sang his hiking songs. The Kimmins and Mita joined in. Kale sang too, but her heart couldn't keep up with the happy beat. I'm not really afraid, just realistically cautious. After all, we're going into Risto's territory. Someone should be worried about the things we may have to face. They ate noon meal at a tavern in Fifth. The long tunnels of Penn reached for miles in a maze-like structure. Rap Jackaport explained that hundreds of years ago, the Tremenhoffers had mined the, uh, this region. Now only dewdrums careened through the passageways. Mile after mile, Rap Jackaport led them deeper into the mountain. Shades of gray mottled the walls of the large tunnels. The floors had been leveled of all bumps and ridges. The walls were hewn smooth by Trimmenhofer tools. So far, this final approach into Risto's stronghold was exceedingly dull. The only breaks from monotony were old minor signs at each corner telling directions. They indicated the four points of a compass, with an arrow showing which direction the tunnel followed. Kale resisted the urge to ask how much further they had to go. I'll be glad when we get to where we're going, retrieve the egg, and hurry out of here. 
the cavern of rainbows, said Rab Jackapart. This is where I leave you. Kale's head jerked up at the sound of the Trumanhofer's voice. His hearty words bounced off the walls. They'd entered a gigantic cavern. Huge, glistening crystals hung from the ceiling in the brilliant hues of a rainbow. The floor was a rippled rock substance that looked as if it was once a thick porridge of pastel shades. Kale imagined someone pouring it out and watching it harden. Round craters dotted the area. They reminded Kale of the dents made by bubbles in the top of porridge cooking in a kettle, only these were quite large. Kale could have put both feet in the one nearest her. Another was wide enough Dar could have lain in it. Three walls were solid light rock, but not the blue she'd seen most often underground. These walls glowed with a clear, silvery light. "'I'll take the cart and burrow back with me,' said Rab Jackaport. "'If you get through the barrier, you'll find miles of natural tunnels. Some of these passages are not big enough for a wagon of any sort.' Brunstetter looked uncomfortable at this. He eyed the small wagon and his own bulk, as if comparing sizes. Litu and Labritowit helped Fenworth climb out of the cart. He sat down on a boulder that glowed a soft pink. Having just awakened from another nap, the old wizard gazed at the vast underground cavern with sleepy eyes, yawned, and stroked his beard. Thank you, dear Rap Jackaport, for guiding us. Fensworth's quiet voice echoed faintly around them. We understand your eagerness to return. We won't detain you. The Trumanhofer bowed with more precise, more precision than elegance, and turned to his cousin. Take care, Labritowit. This is an old job for a librarian. I'm aware of that part, but we do what we must do. They embraced. Learc and Darg unloaded a few supplies from the cart, and helped turn the burrow. Kale remembered to say her thanks as the Trumanhofer left them. But her eyes were on the magnificent cave. The glitter and vivid colors had almost blinded her to a mar of ugliness seeping out of a crevice on the opposite side. In contrast to the beauty of the great stone hall, a mound of black coarse sand, rocks, and boulders spilled out of this one wide crack. Fenworth, leaning heavily on his walking stick, crossed the uneven floor with his eyes trained on the deplorable deformity. A few yards from its base, he sat down again, this time on a lavender boulder. The others started setting up camp, but Kale went to stand by the old man. After a moment, he sighed. He propped his walking stick against his shoulder and placed both hands upon his knees. He leaned forward and squinted at the black, ragged pebbles as if reading written lines amid the pile. Eventually, he reached to take Kale's hand in his without looking away from the crumbly-looking mess in front of them. Crim Cropper. Copper. This, that's who made this atrocity, Kale. Crim Copper. He patted her hand. A mouse fell out of his sleeve and scampered away, ignored by both of them. Risto, burner stocks, and Crim Copper working together. Can't be good, oh dear, oh dear. Can't be good. Dar fixed an especially good supper and played soothing digestion music afterward. Mita sat on his shoulder and sang her syllable song. Kale listened patiently as Labritowit explained again that the little purple dragon's snout wasn't formed for making words like the seven high races used, but the minor dragons had a language of their own. Therefore, the gifted creatures could communicate mentally in the common language but voiced their thoughts with what sounded to us like a string of nonsense syllables. Kale thought the music Mita made without words was lovelier than any ballad she'd heard sung by minstrels at the tavern. The Kimmins joined the singing and danced. Their beautiful clothing changed with each movement. With the pastel lava rock beneath their feet and the vibrant jewel tones dripping as crystals from the ceiling, the spectacular performance kept Kale's attention except for the few times her eyes wandered over to the old wizard. 
Fenworth had scarcely touched his meal, and anything dark cooked usually had his admiration, or at least his attention. The wizard often complained about Labridowitz's lack of culinary skill, to which the Trumanhofer replied, I'm a librarian. Fenworth also enjoyed music. It was peculiar for him to ignore Mita, Dar, and the Kimmins. This night, Fenworth ate a few spoonfuls and put the bowl of green stew aside. He sat, contemplating the barrier. Kale worried every time she noticed how truly occupied the warrior or the wizard was with Crim Copper's black blight on the beautiful cavern. Fenworth grew leaves and didn't bother to shake them off. He drifted into the appearance of a massive trunk that, dissipa that dissipated any time he moved. Occasionally, he stood and paced. Kale tried once to reach into his mind, but, as she'd found from earlier experiences, his thoughts were guarded. A disturbed wizard is not a comforting sight. Comforting sight. Why do the others ignore him? The music drew her back to the activities in the camp, and she began to ask herself questions. All the songs are about friendship. Is it coincidence? No, they're celebrating our brotherhood in the quest. On purpose? Probably. Why? She quit trying to figure it out. The next song had many verses, and she had heard it often. She called Mita to fly to her shoulder. Kale wanted help in remembering the words. Turning her back on Fenworth's brooding figure, she gave herself over to enjoying this evening with her comrades. In the morning, Fenworth still sat on his lavender boulder, keeping vigil over the black barrier. Kale sat next to the Trimmenhofer with a platter of fried mullins to share for breakfast. She nodded at the wizard, who was mostly tree this morning. What is he doing, Libritowit? The librarian picked up a hot stick from the platter, took a bite, and looked over at his longtime friend. Thanking. Could you help him? I mean, with some facts from your research. <laughs> a librarian needs books in order to do research. He chewed for a moment and then swallowed. I have remembered several incidents in history when a wizard was called upon to break down walls. I even remembered one where a wizard moved a mountain, but he was on the outside of the mountain, not within it. There's a difference. What will he do? Think some more. The other sat around and let Fenworth think. Sometimes he paced while he thought. He carried his hat in his hand and wadded it into an unrecognizable clump. He often muttered, but Kale couldn't see that he made any great discovery with all the thinking and pacing and wadding and muttering. Night came and the music was about Walder and the many wonders he had performed. Kale watched the pondering wizard. We need Walder here now. The next morning brought no better results. Fenworth trailed a long, bushy vine off his robes whenever he paced. The little dragons kept close to the old wizard. An abundance of insects scattered out of his leaves every time he moved. Around the campfire that night, they sang of Paladin's mighty deeds. Kale sang along, but her heart yearned for some kind of action. We need Paladin here now. The next morning, she could no longer stand the patience of everyone but her. She wanted nothing more than to go, to go pummel the wizard with a thousand questions and maybe stir his old bones into doing something. She climbed up the wall that sloped toward the black barrier and found her own lavender boulder to sit on. Her moonbeam cape flowed from her shoulders but gave her no sense of being part of a great quest. Jim and Mita sat nestled in their pocket dens and offered no companionship. She sat with her elbows on her knees, her chin on her fists, and her face turned toward Wizard Fenworth as he sat on his rock, starting to look like a bush. She glared at him, then glared at the black barrier. He should do something. This is a waste of time. Why can't he just say, move? Fenworth sprang to his feet and looked straight at Kale. His alarmed expression told her, before the rumbling in the ground, that she had done something terrible. 
Oh, his alarmed expression told her, before the rumbling in the ground, that she had done something terrible. Kale reached down to balance herself on the shoulder on the shuddering boulder. The black mass began beside her began to shift. Down in the campsite, her friends scrambled for cover. Lee Tu and Lee Ark sprinted to the wizard and dragged him, protesting, away from the cascading black gravel. The barrier was coming apart. Thick dust filled the air. Kale fell backward and tumbled down the rocky incline. She heard shouts but couldn't look. Her main concern was to keep from whacking her head as she turned over and over, faster and faster down the slanted wall. She coughed and sputtered and tried to keep her arms wrapped over her head. When she hit the bottom, and the tiny black rocks kept sliding down around her, she curled up in a ball and tried to breathe through the cape. Finally, the mountain quit trembling. Kale sat up, starting another tiny landslide as the mound of gravel covering her fell away. The air was full of thick black dust, so she kept the edge of her cape over her nose and mouth. She blinked dirt from her eyes. The natural light of the magnificent cavern glowed dimly through fine black powder as it settled. The gravel and dust lay over everything, blanketing the former brilliance. Only a half-light showed Kale the small cave surrounding her. When she stopped coughing against the gritty air, she reached into the cape and pulled out Mita and Jim, one in each hand. Mita raced to perch on Kale's shoulder as close to her neck and under her chin as she could get. Jem lay limply in the palm of her hand. She stroked his backbone and let out a sigh of relief when his tail twitched. Fainted again, she said to Mita. He'll be all right. Kale said it more to reassure herself. She felt battered. Her arms and legs ached. Jem would heal her bruises. She examined herself and found only scratches under a black coating of dust. I'll be all right. Nothing is broken. I just have to find the others. I hope no one is hurt. Looking around, she examined the small, separate cave created by the landslide. The rocks formed a new barrier, almost completely surrounding her. She spied a small tunnel, yawning open to the rear. Disoriented from her tumble down the slope, she could not think where it might lead. To the others, I hope. Jim tucked, er, I'm sorry, Kale tucked Jim away in the cape. She crawled on hands and knees through the opening. Mita hummed an encouraging tune in her ear. Long and straight, the tunnel took them to another, larger cave. Kale stood and stretched, feeling her aching muscles. The stone room looked much like the one they had camped in for several days. Great clouds of black dust had blown through the tight tunnel. Kale took stock of her situation. She had the moonbeam cape and her two dragons. She had food among other things, tucked in the cape's hollows. She wasn't badly hurt, nothing Jem couldn't fix. Not too bad. She swallowed the lump in her throat. I wonder where the others are. Hello, Carm. How are you? How are you doing tonight? Oh, all right, Louis. Have a good night. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, I plan to enjoy the book. I love this book. Um, but yes, have a good night. And I will see you next time. Okay. Chapter 43. The Maze. Lee Tu? Kale reached for the Emerlindian with her mind. Jem peeked out of the cape, then darted to her shoulder to sit next to Mita. <coughs> Lee Tu? Are you safe? Mita and Jim? Yes, we're fine. And you? The others? Wizard Fenworth is unconscious. Libretowit has a nasty cut on his forehead. Leoc has a broken arm. A boulder hit brown stutter on the head and he's dizzy. Otherwise he's all right except for cuts and bruises. Shimran and Cecil are dirty but whole. Dar's too dirty to speak intelligibly. He's limping around and he favours one side as if he has some broken ribs. He's muttering about his soiled clothing, not his injuries. 
having some tum troubles, but otherwise, but good otherwise. I am sorry to hear about the tum troubles. That's never any fun. But uh, glad that you're doing well. Other than that. Kale almost smiled, imagining the Doniel's disgust at the sooty dust on everything. But she pictured the old wizard, pale and still. Fenworth? Liberate to it thinks he tried to stem the landslide. It was too much for him. I can't find any broken bones. He seems all right, from what I can see. Jem could tell us more. Kale remembered the horror on Fenworth's face as he looked up at her. She shivered at the memory. The black barrier had collapsed, and somehow Kale had made it happen. Now her comrades were hurt. But if Fenrith had not been able to move the mass in three days, how could she have been responsible? She shook aside the unsettling feeling that her thoughts had sent the black rocks and gravel cascading down upon them all. Where are you? Still in the cavern of rainbows. But when the black barrier collapsed, the walls shifted. Several tunnels out of here appeared. Should I try to come to you? Yes, if you can. We need Jim to help with the injuries. Kale knew exactly which direction to go to find the others now. She could feel Leitu's presence. However, choosing the right tunnel proved difficult. There were so many. Blue light rocks studded the walls of some of the tunnels. Other tunnels were pitch black. Some were twice as high as Kale was tall. Some were barely big enough for her to squeeze into. A sickly sweet smell poured out of one. Others stank of damp and decay. Two smelled like cabbage boiling. Kale dreaded going into any of them. Crawling through yet another tunnel that seemed to lead nowhere, she muttered, At least you two are with me. She stroked each one of the dragons, took a deep breath, and let it out slowly. Reaching into one of the cave's hollows, she pulled out the light rock and handed it to the little dragons. Then they went through the opening closest to where Kale could feel Litu's presence. Mita and Jim sat on her shoulder, holding the soft, glowing light rock between them. Sometimes Kale walked. Sometimes she crawled. Hours later, Kale had discovered how futile was her search. None of the tunnels they explored took them to her inner injured comrades. Some tunnels veered off in the wrong direction after she had crawled for what seemed miles. Others came to dead ends, and Kale had to inch backward to a spot where another tunnel converged with the one that went no place. All the tunnels were filled with bugs and dewdrums. The insects crunched under her feet or crawled over her hands. They fell from the ceiling and slipped under the color collar of her blouse. The dewdrums tore through the stone corridors as if being chased, their normal speed accelerated by a frenzy, probably set off by the landslide. Kale never saw one slow down for anything. They slammed into her at irregular intervals. Sometimes she'd be hit and knocked over, then trodden upon by others following the first. She grew weary and disheartened, and more convinced than ever that all of this was the result of some rash act on her part. I thought, move, and the barrier fell apart. But it's ridiculous to think I could cause such devastation. I am just a slave girl. Mita and Jim did not respond to her words. I was a slave girl. Now I'm a servant of Paladin. That doesn't make any difference. I'm still an o ignorant Orant girl. She backed into the most central cave she'd found and sat down in despair. Don't give up. Li Tu Ben's voice admonished her. We've explored every tunnel going out of this cave. I'm so confused. I don't remember which branches of which tunnels we've already been through. Kale knew her frustration rang in her words, even though they were not spoken. She struggled to control her emotions. The last thing she wanted was to give the Emerlindian another chance to say, Immature, in a disdainful voice. Then mock them. You mean start over? Go back through all the territory we've already explored? Sometimes you have to. Litu's patient tone irritated Kale. 
The Orant girl spoke to her companion dragons instead of the Inralindian. How are we going to mark the tunnels as we go through them? Jim jumped off her shoulder and glided to the entrance of the tunnel where they had just left. He put his front foot in front of his face and spat. A fine green spray collared, coated his paw. He stamped that foot on the wall. Mita leapt in the air, did a somersault, and let out a gleeful squeal. She zip zipped over to Jim and proceeded to imitate him. She left a tiny purple paw print beside the green. The system worked, but it still required hours of walking and crawling. Each time they rested for a few minutes, Jim healed Kale's new hurts. Under the influence of, her, of his healing, she could have forgotten to eat. But Mita liked mealtime and snack time and nap time. She sang mealtime tunes every so often. The words would flit through Kale's consciousness and remind her to eat. Kale watched Mita catching bugs, sometimes bringing extra ones to Jim, who sat on his friend's lap and thrummed. The healing vibrations did much to ease Kale's discomfort physically, but her nagging thoughts remained, it hurt, remained, it, remained hurtful. I don't understand why you think stopping to eat is better than eating bugs along the way. Kale snapped at the purple dragon. Mita dropped on her haunches and stared at Kale. Kale looked away from the dragon's sad eyes. I'm sorry. Mita flew across to land on her favorite spot, tucking herself under Kale's chin. She began to sing. Kale chuckled and stroked the purple scales of the dragon's side with one finger. Do you know a tune for every occasion? After a rest, Kale began her hunt through the maze of tunnels. And Kale again began her hunt through the maze of tunnels. We are so close this time. She sat beside another dead end. Litu? I know. You can't be more than a few feet away. Let me ask Brunstutter if he can move these boulders from the side. Perhaps we can break through. In a few moments, Kale heard some scraping against stone. The wall of rocks making up the blockage trembled. With a surge of hope, she picked up smaller stones and moved them away. In a matter of minutes, a slanted hole appeared, and Kale looked into Brunstetter's smiling eyes. "'Welcome back, little stray,' he said and winked. Kale laughed. The Udom's huge face disappeared, and Litu's popped into view. She too smiled and laughed. "'Haven't you had a minute to wash your face, O Rant Curl? You look like a thousand-year-old Immerlindian.' Imer the Britowit showed his face next, and when Kale saw the bloody bandage on his head, she gasped. Here, take Jim. He can start the healing while we make the hole bigger for me to get through. The librarian shook his head gingerly. No, Kale. His powers only work with you nearby. Best if you can actually make the circle of healing by touching. Move aside, Truman Hoffer, Brunstetter ordered good-naturedly his deep voice rumbling in a way that comforted Kale's raw emotions. She leaned toward the opening <laughs> to see if she could spot Fenworth's still form. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, she leaned around the opening to see if she could spot Fenworth, Dar, and the Kimmins. Dar and the Kimmins sat around Fenworth's still form. As Kale watched, their heads snapped up, their attention riveted by something out of Kale's line of vision. Excuse me. Dar jumped up and pulled his sword from its scabbard. Kale heard the battle cry of a bison back. Brunstetter dropped the rock in his hands and ran toward the camp. Litu raced after him. A swarm of soldiers descended on her friends before they had a chance to defend themselves. Shimron and Cecil jumped in the air, but a net shot over them and captured the Kimmins as it fell. Dar didn't have a chance to duck into his shell. He moved slowly and Kale knew Litu was right. His injuries must be worse than just bruises. What can I do? An explosion of light? M move mounds of dirt? I, I don't know how. All right, Carm, sleep well. Have a good night. Lurking is uh, perfectly acceptable. If nothing else, maybe uh, the reading can help you doze off. Oh, 
She watched in helpless horror as Lee Ark and Brunstetter fell under the assault of dozens of Bisonbeck warriors. When the fighting stopped, each of her comrades had been captured. Chains bound Lee to Lee Ark, Brunstetter, Dar, and the Britowit to each other at the ankle and around the neck. A net entangled the Kimmin so tightly that they lay in a huddled heap. Four guards stood around Wizard Fenworth as if the old man would arise and smite them all. Kale cringed at the pointed spears inches away from the ancient and vulnerable wizard. Not one of her comrades glanced toward the small opening where Kale's eyes peered through, watching as the Bisonbecks destroyed the tents and scattered their belongings. Litu, what should I do? Stay out of sight. Yes, but I can do something, can't I? To help you get free? Find the mage egg, O Rock Girl. And get out of this mountain. But follow orders, Kale. And don't play with your talents. Treat them with respect, or more disaster will fall upon your head. The bison back commander roared. His troops fell into military formation. A soldier roughly lifted the old wizard and slung him over his shoulder. His friends began their march out of the Cavern of Rainbows. Kale ground her teeth. My talents. I don't help anyone with my talents. I cause disaster. Why? Why give a stupid Orant slave talents? Ace Hoods, thank you for the follow. Glad you're enjoying the stream thus far. Hope you continue to enjoy, and welcome to the dark side. How are you doing tonight, Ace? Chapter 44 In the Stronghold As soon as the last soldier marched through the exiting tunnel, the yeah, through the exiting tunnel, Kale began to claw away loose stones around the small opening. Minutes later, she crammed her body into the narrow hole and pushed and wiggled and squirmed until she fell out the other side. She tumbled and slid before coming to rest against a boulder covered with black dirt. Mita and Jim flew through the shallow slit she'd made and landed beside her. She stood and walked around in a daze. She picked up Fenwar's pointed wizard hat and bunched it into a wad, much the way the wizard did when he was thinking. She walked aimlessly around the destroyed campsite. Mita and Jim followed, making sad, chirping noises to each other. Kale stooped to pick up Dar's flute. A dent in the side showed rough treatment by the vicious bison becks. Dar will want this, she said to the dragons. Maybe he can fix it. She wiped it off with the wizard's hat and stuck it into one of the hollows of her cape. She picked up Dar's smashed harmonica and several other small musical instruments, all variously damaged, and quickly stilled them away. The Tremenhofer's stack of books had been kicked over and thrown in all directions. Kale gathered them, dusted off the sooty grime, and fitted them into a hollow. Picking up a pair of Lobritowitz reading spectacles, she noted a cracked lens and put it away with the other things she had collected. Collapsing on a boulder, gray with grim copper's smudge, crim copper's smudge, Kale dropped her head into her hands, fighting the urge to cry. With a shudder, she sat up. It's no use pretending things aren't bad. The dragons flew to her shoulders. We've got to consider what's best to do, and then do it. She stared at the debris around her, absent-mindedly putting Fenwar's hat on her head. She shook, her sh shook herself as if trying to wake up. Keeping broken things won't help. She pulled out the spectacles and intended to throw them as far as she could. Jim hopped on her shoulder and trilled. The high-pitched warble pierced the silent room. What? Kay lifted a hand to rub against her ear. Jim's excited squeal had been all too close to her eardrum. At his urging, she looked at the broken lens. It's fixed. Hold on, my eye is really burning. Okay. 
Kale jumped to her feet. The dragons lost their balance, fluttered beside her for a moment, and then landed on the rocks. Kale pulled out the books and found the page unwrinkled, untorn. Found the pages unwrinkled, untorn. The book covers pristine clean. The flute was dentless. She lifted the harmonica to her mouth and blew. A reedy chord resounded merrily in the forlorn cavern. She marveled at the undamaged instruments as she laid them in a row on the ground. You'd think somebody would have told me. She repacked the atoms in her the items in her cave and continued to rummage through the mess left by the bison becks. She picked up items belonging to each of her comrades, except the Kimmins. Again, she puzzled over the fact that she had rarely see them, seen them carrying anything. Do you suppose they have hollows in their light clothes? The dragons didn't offer an opinion. Kale picked up Litu's bow, broken into two pieces. She looked from the pieces in her hands to the dragons, watching her with expectant faces. Kale could feel them urging her to try it. She fitted the two ends of the bow together. The shaft stretched taller than she did. Kale slid, slipped it into the hollow opening. The bow slid in easily, moving down and down, until the whole bow disappeared. Kale held her breath and pulled it back out. The jagged edges where she'd put the two pieces together had mended. No sign of breakage existed, not even a seam. Look at that! Wait until I show Lee to. The Emerlindian's words echoed in her memory. Follow orders, Kale. I don't play with your talents. Treat them with respect, or more disaster will fall on your head. Hello, Black Knight Devil. Is this Bow -chick -bow -wow. Exiting? Hello, or Black Knight Devil, thank you for the follow. Glad you're enjoying the stream thus far. Hope you continue to enjoy, and welcome to the Doric side. How are you doing tonight? Kale looked quickly at the dragons. Both had turned their heads aside and refused to look her in the eye. This isn't my talent. It's something the cape does. The dragons made grunty noises in their throats. I'm doing pretty well, Black Knight. Sorry for interrupting. Oh, no worries. I don't mind. I pretty much just read like a paragraph or two and oh, I'm always checking to see uh, what pops up in chat, so no worries at all. <coughs> uh, the dragons made grunty noises in their throats. Kale growled back. All right, guilty, she said, and her shoulders slumped. When will I ever learn? She shoved the bow back into the hollow and gathered Li Tu's arrows into the leather quiver. When she finished, she gazed around the cavern of rainbows and sighed over its dulled appearance. Her eyes rested on one of the many tunnels leading out. Hello, Ace Hoods. How are you doing tonight? <clears throat> I'm gonna need to pour myself more tea in a second. Well, Jem, Mita, we have things to do. Kale marched along the disheveled room, exiting the cavern by the same tunnel the Bisonbeck warriors had used earlier. I'm supposed to be looking for the meech egg. It is probably kept in the center of Risto's stronghold. The Bisonbecks were probably returning to their underground fortress. It is reasonable to follow them. Now, if I just happen to come across my friends on the way as I'm looking for the meech egg, and I happen to see a way to help them escape, then that wouldn't be disobeying orders. She could feel the direction she needed to turn each time she came to tunnels branching off, just as she could judge the distance between herself and the last of the marching soldiers. She put the hood and veil over her head so she could see in the dimmer passageways. Following her captured friends was not difficult. 
However, staying out of the way of the citizens of this underground community became a problem. Drawing while listening, slow relaxing. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Doing great. Love your stream. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm really glad people enjoy this stream. It's uh, always really nice to hear. Also, if you guys would like to vote, my bot just popped it up. If you guys would like to vote on what book I read next, because um, I'm hoping I might finish this book t uh, this week. Otherwise, um, oh, I'm sure I'm going to finish it this week. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm not sure if I'll go on to the next book in the series, or... Um, Actually, let me check and see what the poll says so far. Yeah, right now it looks like uh, we're probably going to be reading Artemis Fowl next. So. But if you guys would like to vote, you are more than welcome to. We've got a variety of books that are up uh, to go next. So, okay. For a while, the stone corridors were eerily empty. No dewdrums, no insects. Kale concentrated on the movement of the troop of soldiers surrounding her comrades. Jem and Mita darted about, unsuccessfully looking for snacks. As they approached one bend, the two dragons bolted for Kale and dove into their pocket dens. She got the distinct impression someone was approaching on the, around a blind corner and flattened herself against the wall, remaining still so that her cape hid her. She heard heavy footsteps slamming against the stone floor. Five seconds later, two soldiers, large and surly, tramped past her without one look in her direction. She soon discovered that Jim and Mita could hear someone's approach better than she could. As they neared the center of Risto's stronghold, the dragons warned her repeatedly when someone was coming. The humid air became harder to breathe. A stale, rancid odor burned her throat. The dragons coughed, objecting to the unpleasant atmosphere. The tunnels widened, and they met carts pulled by donkeys and people on horseback. Miss would you miss? Also, welcome to the stream. Is it, uh, Xyso? Xyso? Is it Xyso? I'm not sure how to pronounce that uh, username, but welcome to the stream. Uh, do you mean the, uh, the poll? Miss the poll? There you go. Uh, sure thing. Sure thing, trusty. Also, welcome to the stream. Um, more than welcome to ask. If I don't know the answer, then I don't know the answer. <laughs> but, um, sure thing. I mean, I would just tell her that that's not actually something you're interested in. You just would write, like, to... You're just, you know, planning to hang out. Um, and if she's not accepting of that, then... Maybe give your mom a call. Um, rather than texting. Because, uh... I don't know, moms tend to be a lot better about answering phone calls than text messages. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm really not sure. I've never been in a situation like that myself. Um, but no, I would, I would be honest with her, tell her that's not really something you're interested in. Um, and yeah, wish I could help more. <laughs>
The humid air became harder to breathe. A stale, rancid odor burned her throat. The dragons coughed, objecting to the unpleasant atmosphere. The tunnels widened and they met cars, carts pulled by donkeys and people on horseback. Just when Kale thought she would not make any more progress with all the stopping they did for traffic, the army marched down a wide staircase and entered a less populated region. Kale and the dragons followed, and followed again, when the prisoners were taken down another, narrower set of stone steps. The dungeon! Jim, Mita, soon they'll put our friends in cells and leave them. Maybe then we can do some good. Once more, the tunnels branched, this time in three different directions. The major part of the bison vet guard marched off to the left. A few took the weary prisoners down to the central corridor. When Kale got to the intersection, she turned right. She stopped and turned around, coming back to the point where the tunnels merged. To her left was the way back where she, from where she had come. Straight ahead, she could sense more bison becks than she had ever encountered before. To the right lay the dungeons, she was sure. Her body turned and headed back down the wrong hallway. She stopped again and tried to turn. I don't know. She answered the dragon's inquiries. One foot moved forward, and Kale strained to keep the other from following. She lost the battle and took several steps before she could stop again. She peered down the dark, rocky hall and saw nothing beyond dreary walls and a few dim light rocks. She took a few steps forward before she even realized she was moving. I want to follow Darren Lee too, she tried to turn, but I can't. She stomped her foot. What's down there? Is this a trap? Maybe it's the meach, egg pull meach dragon egg pulling at me. She shivered as she looked at the stone cold stone walls of the wizard's domain, realizing she was far away from home, friends, and anything good. Maybe Risto has some kind of enchantment that lures trespassers into his clutches, and I'm the next victim. Mita and Jim exchanged a, exchanged a nervous chitter. Kale understood they wanted to stop her in some way. Mita began to sing, and for an instant, Kale felt a release from the pool. When it came back, it tugged so hard, she ran away before she could slow herself down. She couldn't stop. Ahead, she could see two bison vet guards standing at attention beside a large arch archway. Probably Risto's hall where he receives visitors. He's probably waiting in there to see what his enchantment has brought him this time. Don't go in with me, Mita. Jim, fly away. Hide. There's no reason for you to be caught as well. The soldiers ahead spotted her. They lowered their spears to ready position. Halt! One ordered. But she was helpless to do as he commanded. Mita began to sing a slow, melodious tune, soothing and peaceful. Thank you very much, Mita, but my nerves are beyond succumbing to your ministrations. I'm about to be killed, I think. The second guard took a step forward. Halt! I'm trying. Believe me, I'm trying. Mita crooned. Why did Paladin choose a singing dragon? A fighting dragon, a fire dragon, an invisible dragon would have been useful. Mita flew forward and circled the heads of the guards. They did not seem to notice her, but stared at Kale's approach. Maybe Mita is invisible. Kale gave an excited, or Jim gave an excited flip in the air and landed back on Kale's shoulder. Neither guard challenged her again. Kale walked up to them and studied their faces as she passed. They breathed, but they did not blink. The pupils of their eyes were mere dots. Their gazes were locked on some point down the hallway where she had been moments before. They don't see me. They don't hear me either? Mita continued to fly slowly around them, singing her soothing syllable song. She entranced them. Jim somersaulted in the air. Kale turned her head to observe the room she entered. Who will be here to greet me? More guards? More mesmerized guards, I hope? No one? She searched the corners of the room with her eyes, while she continued to step toward a wooden cabinet. Her palms itched to open the, collab the elaborate carved doors set in the opposite wall. Her hand went up to the knob, twisted, and pulled as soon as she reached it. 
The door swung open noiselessly. Inside, a huge egg sat on a velvet-lined basket. It was twice as big around as Kale, and as tall as she was from her waist to the top of her head. Jim chirruped a note of victory. Kale put her hand tentatively on the hard shell. The surface shimmered with a pearlescent luster. Don't be so happy, little friend. How am I supposed to lift something this big? <clears throat> Chapter 45 The Voice of Evil Jim, now I have to go get the others. Brent said I could carry this, but I can't. Kale rubbed the cold surface of the giant meat egg with her fingertips. Colors surfaced on the glossy white shell and rippled like oil in a rain puddle. Jem flew into the huge cupboard and circled around the egg. His eyes glowed with admiration, and he voiced his excitement with a constant stream of trills and chirrups. It is beautiful, Kale agreed. She tried to step back from the meat egg to get a better look. Her feet did not respond, and her hand stuck to the shell. No! She pulled again. She grasped the stuck hand with her other and yanked. The palm, resting on the egg, burned as if she were ripping off her skin. Tears welled up in her eyes. Is this a trap? Do I have to stay here until Risto comes? Ah, the Orant girl. A deep voice filled her mind. A gloating laugh followed the words. <laughs> I suspected ten years ago that your existence was a myth. I'm actually gratified that you have come to me. Uh, who are you? Wizard Andor Tarum Risto. And you... <coughs> Excuse me. And you are Kale, the last of the Alaroins. For one second, Kale wanted to ask him about the Alaroins. But she realized that evil had access to her mind, and Granny Noon had warned her about the dangers of communicating with the wicked in any form. I stand under Walter's authority. As she repeated the words the old Emerlindian had given her, she felt Risto receding from her thoughts. I stand under Walter's authority. She heard his sinister chortle before his presence completely left her mind. I stand under Walter's authority. She looked quickly around the room expecting the evil wizard to appear. We have to get out of here. Surely he's coming. She pulled away from the egg and fell over, sitting down hard on the stone floor when her hand was released. She tried to jump to her feet, ready to run from the large chamber, but her legs would not obey. Jim chirped at her. I can't take the egg with me. She turned on Jim and blistered him with a frustrated glare. Think of something useful. Kale clenched her fists and drew her arms inside the moonbeam cape, folding them over her chest. I can't carry it. What can I do? Nothing, Orant girl. Crystal's voice mocked her. The taunting words sounded as if they had come from somewhere in the room. Kale whirled around, but saw nothing in the shadows. I stand under Walter's authority! She shouted. She clapped her hands over her ears, and tried to block any word Risto might hurl at her. The cloth of the cape came up as well in her haste to cover her ears. The cape, Kale whispered. If I can get the egg into, onto the cape, I might be able to push it into a hollow. Th then I could carry it. She whipped the cape off her shoulders and spread it on the floor, lining side up, lying side up in front of the cabinet. Jim flew around her as if expecting her action, inspecting her actions from every angle. I don't think I will hurt it if it drops, she said, but I'll try to ease it down, just in case. Kill put her arms around the egg and braced her legs, ready to lift with all her strength. She gave a mighty heave and discovered that the egg weighed less than they do. She lost her balance and staggered backward. Kim flipped, Jim flipped several times in the air and landed on the floor, just as she steadied herself. She carefully lowered the egg onto her cape, then stood shaking her head in amazement. Weight's not the problem, 
she said after a moment. But the opening to the hollow is way too small for the meat shake. With Jim sitting close, intently watching her struggle, Kale tried to get the hollow opening to stretch. It's hopeless. Ah, yes, so oh rat girl. It is hopeless. But your task is unnecessary at any rate. Kale wrinkled her brow and tried to think. Her head hurt now as Risto Mind spoke. She needed to concentrate on how to solve the problem of moving the egg. The talent that attracted her to dragon eggs would not let her leave without the meat egg. I would like to discuss my plans with you. Would a new race be such a bad thing? Did Walder really say new races should not be created? I merely want to supply the world with a workforce. Kale regretted not ever having read the great tomes, which told the history of Walder's involvement with the world. She knew the general story from tavern songs and bedtime stories. Walder had molded the land and sea and air out with his thoughts. He'd taken a bit of land and sea and air and formed each of the seven high races. But there were many things she did not know. She didn't know if Walder had said not to make any more races. The ache in her temples eased a bit. Now she remembered that in all the tavern songs, the making of the seven low races resulted in tragedy. A sharp pain streaked behind her eyes. Kale bent over and held her head in her hands. Did you like cleaning chicken coops? Scrubbing floors? The race of beings I propose will actually get pleasure out of doing things the high races disdain. This is not such a bad thing. You are not wise enough to make judgments against me, Kale Alleroin. The way Risto said her last name made Kale shiver. He hated her. She knew it. I stand under Walter's authority. I stand under Walter's authority. The pain in her head subsided. She sank to the floor, feeling drained. Mistress Miker's blue scarf? I can make a sling like the one I used for carrying an infant while I worked. Jim dove into a pocket and returned in only a moment with a long strip of soft cloth. Kale tied the bottom two corners of the cape to one end of the scarf, and the top to the other two, and the top two to the other. The large meat egg hung as if in a snug hammock. With the scarf over one shoulder and across her chest, the cape cradled the egg against Kale's back. She felt no weight to speak of, but the shifting bundle was bulky and cumbersome. It's the best we can do, Jim. Let's get Mita and get out of here. Mita continued to fly around the two guards and sing until Kale and Jim had raced down the corridor away from the room. It is hopeless, little Alleroin. Hopeless. I stand under Walter's authority. Mita caught up with them. Kale wondered how long the effect of the purple dragon's song would keep the guards immobile. Better to hurry and not waste time wondering. Kale could feel in which direction the masses of Risto's minions were gathered. She figured she could avoid pockets of concentration. She needed to go higher, as quickly as possible, to reach a tunnel leading outside. Her plan was to avoid meeting anyone and move upwards at all times. At the first corner, she met a parade of people moving down the hall, as if they had a common gathering place in mind. Few of these citizens of the underground stronghold were soldiers. The smattering of high races among the Bisonbeck women and tradesmen puzzled Kale. She watched for a moment, or two before turning back into the tunnel she'd already traveled. She'd have to find another, less crowded passageway. You see, O oh Rant Girl, not all of your people are so stubborn. Some embrace the benefits of joining me in my efforts to make the world a more pleasant place to live, an easier place, a place where individuals struggle less. I stand under Walter's authority. I won't listen to Risto. If those people are so thrilled to follow him, why aren't they smiling? Those poor people looked as mesmerized as the guards did when we just sang to them. Granny said to never said never to mind ske speak with one of the evil ones. They get a foothold in your mind that way. I, I won't listen to him. I stand under Walter's authority. I stand under Walter's authority. After several false starts, dodging people, backtracking and hiding, 
Kill found herself trudging down a stone hallway, with branches spouting off at every few yards. Small niches in the wall, where boulders had crumbled and fallen into the corridor, offered places to hide. Kale was ready to jump into one at any moment. The feeling of a great populace of bison decks nearby made her edgy. Jim and Mita flew for the most part, instead of riding on her shoulders. Grateful for their vigilance in spotting trouble, Kale also longed for them to be constantly near. Hey, Lunar. I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? <laughs> Getting to the climax of the story. <laughs> I walk beside you, dear Orant girl. Risto's voice came rich and warm into her thoughts. I am not in the habit of sending my friends into dangerous situations alone. I find it reprehensible that you must face these hardships without proper training, without comrades. Who prevented you from going to the hall? Who allowed your friends to be hurt and captured? Before Kale could repeat the words that closed off Risto's intrusion, Mita and Jem darted back around the corner. Kale scrambled and torn the stone pockets in the wall behind fallen boulders and flattened herself to the floor. She knew as long as she was still, the cape would cloak the egg from sight. Kale held her breath as the bison beck soldiers stopped a few feet from where she hid. She could see something of their movements between two rocks. Two argu argued vehemently over whether or not the men had time to go to the ale house before evening duty. Three men, waiting for the argument, arguing two to come to a decision, leaned their massive so shoulders against the walls and rested. One man came and sat on, his, on the boulder, shielding Kale and her friends. Kale felt Jim trembling within his pocket den. Her own heart pounded. She clenched her fists, willing herself to stay still. You see the peril you were subjected to. You were un if you were under my command, these men would be no threat to you. Leave me alone. But I don't want to leave you alone. I care about what happens to you. Ask yourself, Kale Alleroin, who is beside you in this time of trouble? Paladin? Walder? No. I am. I offer help. Again, Risto's tone of voice, smooth and coaxing, slipped on the name Alleroin. A bitter edge poisoned this sweet, persuasive speech. Kale gasped. She'd been listening to him. I stand under Walter's authority. Just as she felt the heavy presence of Risto leave her mind, a strong hand grasped her shoulder and jerked her out of hiding. The Oron girl! A coarse voice bellowed in triumph. Surely it's not the one Risto seeks? You fool, who else would it be? One of the peasants. A drudge. Look at the burden it carries. They are all at evening discourse. None would be brave enough to forego the instruction. Let's see what it carries. Kale twisted in the bison back's hard hold and kicked out. He grunted but did not loosen his grip. Ah! Oh! cried another. My eyes! Kale spotted an, an irate soldier, wiping purple dye from his face. He potted his eyes. I can't see! Minor dragons! It is the mighty M dragon keeper! Hold fast, the demon! It'll be your head if it escapes! Kale squirmed against the iron grasp. Both Mita and Jim flew around the bison beck's heads, spitting into their faces. With the, when a spew of green or purple liquid landed directly in a soldier's eyes, he doubled over in pain, clawing at his face, trying to wipe away the thick spittle. The last one to get sprayed was the one holding Kale. His hands jerked away from her shoulders. She ran. The little dragon zoomed beside her. Their wingtips brushed her hair and cheeks. The outraged cries of the blinded men echoed in the stone corridor. The meat jig bounced against her back reminding her that she could only duck into tunnels large enough for its unwieldy bulk. 
She passed several small crawlways and entered into a dark burrow she hoped would be a tight squeeze for the soldiers should they recover enough to follow. I'm good, thanks. Did you? I did. I did, uh, Lunar. I watched the video as well. Very nice video. How many Wednesdays has it been on this book? Um. Give me a second. This is number five. <laughs> no, this is number six. Because I put part three twice. When really it was only once. Er, so, okay, so yeah. One, two, three, four, five. So this is week six. can't wait for Feb 20th. I bet. I bet that that sounds like a really exciting. I'm excited to see your stuff. Excuse me. Oh. Okay. No, 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 no. This is not the first night I haven't. I have not managed 286 words in one night. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. She passed several small crawlways and turned into a dark burrow she hoped would be a tight squeeze for the soldiers should they recover enough to follow. The passageway narrowed. She ducked her head out from under the blue scarf strap and dragged the egg behind her. She came to a fork. Which way? You are inside my stronghold, Orant girl. Each way leads to me. I stand under Walder's authority. Oh, wow. That's fun. I think. <laughs> I don't know. But hey, speed is good. Speed is very good. The two dragons sat before her, peering down the small, dingy tunnels. Do you know which way to go? Mita and Jim looked at each other, and exchanged a few words Kale couldn't understand. But she understood their thoughts. Each would take a tunnel and explore. Kale was to rest. Kale almost laughed when Mita's motherly suggestion to eat something and take a little nap settled in her mind. But the idea of them leaving her, if only for a few minutes stuck her heart, struck her heart with terror. Had to eat breakfast? Always good, always good. Food, food is good. No worries, Black Knight. I hope you enjoyed your breakfast. What if Jim runs into something scary and faints? The little green dragon gave her a disgusted look. Yes, I did notice you fought that last bunch of bison backs. She answered his prodding question, even though, until that moment, she hadn't realized what an accomplishment the skirmish had been for her dragon friend. I'm proud of you. Jim nodded his satisfaction with her, his satisfaction with her praise, and zoomed into one of the tunnels. Mita disappeared into the other. Eat? I guess I have to. She took out a passage er, a package from inside her cape and nibbled on tasty cheese sticks made by Lee Ark's wife. In a moment, Mita came back. The tunnel had ended in a pile of rubble. She sat in Kale's lap and shared the cheese, turning her nose up at the bread. When they finished, the purple dragon curled up on Kale's knee and hummed one of Kadar's digestion songs. Kale squeezed her eyes shut against sudden tears. 
Most of my people are settled in their homes for the night. A hearth glowing with a warm fire. The smell of stew and fresh, fresh baked, baked bread left of, from dinner with their families. You don't have to be alone. Kale sighed, weary from a long day filled with troubles. I stand under Walter's authority. She heard Risto's mocking laugh and then welcomed the silence. Her chin drooped against her chest and she dozed. The dungeon! The dungeon! Oh, Lito, Dar, Fenworth! Kale awoke to Jim's frantic explanation of what he had found. Kale reached for the blue scarf and followed the excited dragon. After a long crawl, Kale stopped behind Mita and Jim as they hovered next to a natural slit in the stone wall. She heard Wizard Fenrir's scratchy voice. Uncomfortable things. Nope, that's not the right voice. <clears throat> One second. There we go. Uncomfortable things, quests. Not always predictable. A bit boring when nothing is going on. But then, dungeons are always boring. Quests. What a bother. Lose things, find things. Meet the most unpleasant people. Present company ex accepted, of course. Alright, let's see here. Very excited. Speed's is gonna make me able to stream again. Yay! And make YouTube videos. That's awesome, Lunar. I have a belly drum done. <laughs> I can read your homework. Oh no! Ugh, homework. <laughs> Please no. I haven't had to do homework since like three years. <laughs> Don't, don't make me do homework again. You feel so rich. <laughs> How many gems do you have, Lunar? I'm curious. Because we have both scales and gems. So. Okay. There may have been gambling incidents. <laughs> Uh, may just maybe, LFB. Just maybe. Also, how are you doing tonight? It's too much static in my hairs. Oh no! Static sucks. Static sucks. Be careful, don't shock anyone. I have not many on this one. <laughs> it, it happens. Glad to hear you're doing all right, LFB. <laughs> yeah, you do have quite a lot on the uh, Forgotten Umbreon account. Um, I think you've also you've also participated in lots of um, heists, so that would make a difference as well. Excuse me. Okay. Chapter 46. Some things can be moved, some can't. Kale peered through the little hole and almost whooped with joy. Lee too sat with the Britowit deep in a discussion. Learc, Dar, and Brunstetter leaned against one wall, eyes shut, looking pale and unhealthy. Shimmerin and Cecil were not in sight. Fenrir sat cross-legged in the center of their cell. One arm looked very treeish, but the other hand rubbed across his bald spot, keeping that side free of leaves and twigs. Without his hat, the old man looked very forlorn. A wizard should not be without his hat. He looks so old. 
As soon as the thought flitted across her mind, Jim dove into the cape and came out, pulling the large pointed hat behind him. Kale grinned and nodded. She took the hat from him and stuffed it through the small hole. There, she wiggled it back and forth, waiting for it to catch someone's attention. See, said Fenworth, you lose things, you find things. Now there's my hat, and it's about time. Leetu jumped up and ran to snatch the hat out of Kale's hand. The welcoming smile on her face transformed into a glare almost immediately. You're supposed to be searching for the meat shag. I've got it right here. Then you're supposed to be taking it out of the mountain. I've been trying. Kale glared right back at Leetu. This is not such an easy job. There are miles of tunnels down here, and most of them go in circles. Here now, mustn't quarrel. Fenworth came up behind Leetu and reclaimed his hat. He smoothed the brim, straightened the pointy crown, and placed it on his head. Ah, uh, now that feels better. He smiled broadly at Kale. I assume you have your dragons with you. Yes, sir. Let's have Jem, then. If he doesn't mind assisting me, we'll patch up our comrades' aches and woes. Mita could sing us some encouragement. Jem wiggled to the opening and flew to the old wizard's shoulder. I thought Jem could only heal with me. Kale frowned as both her dragons attached themselves to Fenworth. Litu put her fists on her hips and frowned. Only you and any wizard in the service of Paladin. Her frown deepened. Actually, I think an evil wizard could also force Jim to heal, but I also think it would hurt him. But I think I was too stingy with my other file. I was waiting for, like, raffles and stuff. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. One of those metal brushes that... Yeah, that, that would be a good thing. Kale started to tell Lee too that Risto had spoken to her, but she hesitated. Shame washed over her as she thought she had done something bad. Instead of confiding in her mentor, she turned back to the egg in its moonbeam cape sling and undid the knot so she could more easily get to the hollows. She called Lee too back to the hole. Here's your bow. Oh, where's Shimmerin and Cecil? Lee too took her weapon, running an experienced hand over the wood, checking for damage. They're being kept some some place else. It would have been easy, too easy for them to escape this cell. Kale looked across the small room and noted the wall of bars. The Kimmins could have walked right between them. She passed Dar's flute and harmonica into Litu's waiting hand. Some of the instruments were too big to fit through. I have your books and the Britowitz, but they won't fit either. Why did you bother? I don't know. I thought you'd want them. I seem to remember telling you. I know, we do. I just picked them up. I don't know why. Kale pushed Dar's small sword and scabbard through the hole. She had difficulty filting, fitting the hilt of Brunstetter's sword through, and the sheath would not fit through even with Leetu pulling and Kale pushing. When she had passed as much of her friend's belongings as she could to Leetu, she peered into the small room to see what progress Fenworth and Jim had made. Dar sat up, gave her a wave, and gave her a wave and a wink. Lee Ark and Brunstetter carefully inspected their returned weapons. Labridowit had his reading glasses on, and was reading a small vol volume of poetry. Fenworth walked over to the opening, where Lee stood on one side and Kale on the other. Food would be helpful, dear girl, and water. Food. Lee Too sighed. You picked up books, but not food. I have some left from my provisions. Kale handed over all that she had. You see, they don't even appreciate what you've bought the brought them. I stand under Walter's authority. Both Fenworth and Leetu's heads turned sharply as she uttered the phrase with anger. Risto? asked Fenworth, with her eyebrow raised. Kale nodded, and then realized he probably couldn't see more than her nose and mouth from where he stood. 
Yes, she admitted. He's been badgering you? Yes, she whispered. How like him. Fenris shuffled off to the others, carrying parcels of food in his arms. Leetu moved closer to the hole and leaned forward. Kale, you haven't been talking with Raisto, have you? No. Kale shifted uncomfortably. Well, not much. The frown disappeared from Leetu's face, and compassion registered in her eyes. Are you all right? Kale took a deep, a big breath. I think so. He lies. Yes. It sounds like truth. Yes. Li Tu grinned and winked at Kale. If you were an Emerlendian, you'd be a shade darker. Kale's eyes widened and her mouth dropped open. She snapped it shut before Li Tu could say something about her not knowing anything or having a lot to learn. Dar sprinted across the prison cell, waving his harmonica. Kale! He reached a hand to the opening to touch the one she had resting there. You are a sight for sore eyes. What little I can see of you. You have the meat egg. She nodded. She needs to take it out of here. Lithu sounded practical and gruff again. We have our weapons. We can escape. You go on before us. Don't wait. Kale shook her head. I'm getting nowhere. I need help. Alright, Lunar, sleep well. Have a good night. No English wear subs. I don't have a sub button. Officer Nasty. Also, the that purged comment was inappropriate, and I am going to ask that you not use any kind of language like that. Second warning. Watch your language. Be respectful. Sleep well, Lunar. Have a fantastic evening. I'm sure I will sleep very well, Lunar. Oh, okay. Kale shook her head. I'm getting nowhere. I need help. Learch joined them. He no longer held one injured arm cradled against his chest. I agree with the Orant girl. Leitu, you assume too much. Her talents are strong, but she is untrained. Paladin chose her, which certifies her ability, but he also chose us to accompany her. We are stronger together. Kale looked, or Dar looked into Kale's eyes and gave her another wink. He turned to Learnk and nodded pointedly at the hole through which Kale stared. It seems to me that we have a problem in this togetherness thing. The Marion commander gave a decisive nod and walked back to confer with Brunstetter. The little dragons flew back, back to the hole and squeezed through. Both were exhilarated with their success. They chattered to each other, until Kale interrupted. I don't think Brunstetter can move any of this rock. Mita and Jim both cocked their heads and inspected the wall of granite as they sat on her shoulder. They muttered to each other, and Kale got the gist of their thoughts. People had the strangest notions of how to spend their time. Excuse me. They want to get out of the dungeon, she explained. Can you look further down this tunnel and see if there's a way out? They darted off without responding. Brunstetter looked the hole over. Fenworth examined it as well. Tut tut. Some things can't be moved easily. I could make Kale smaller if you want her in here with us. But it would be more to the point for us to go out there with her. 
Can't say I like these accommodations. Food isn't edible as well. They haven't brought us any food, said the Brita Wit at his elbow. The wizard jumped. Don't scare me like that, Wit. Why aren't you at your books? Proves my point, though. Can't very well eat food that isn't served. Therefore, it is inedible. He turned and whispered to Dar in a voice loud enough for all to hear. Sneaky fellow, sneaky quiet fellows are librarians. One moment he has his nose in a book, the next he's dragging a decent, respectable wizard off on a harrowing request. A harrowing quest. No respect for my age and station in life. The Britowitz useful, I have to admit. Still, he can't cook. He's my friend, though, and you have to make allowances for friends. None of them are perfect. Very few of them can cook. <sighs> Grunted the Britowit and tramped away. The wizard, shaking his head in befuddlement, watched the Tremenhofer stomp, stomp across the cell. Kale's attention caught on the flutter of leathery wings. Mita and Jem had returned. They found Shimmerin and Cecil, Kale told the Ark. I'm going to go see if I can get them out. Then we'll come back for you. The Ark nodded. You might remember, interrupted Litu in Kale's mind, who is in command. It's more proper to ask the Ark if you can go, rather than tell him. Kale felt her face burn red. She looked quickly from Litu's disapproving face to Liark's amused one. She heard Dar chuckle and looked at him. I think, said the Donia with a cocky grin, our little Orant slave girl is doing a good job of thinking for herself. Are you sure you don't read my mind? Never. Now go see if you can help our Kimmin friends. If he can't cook, he's not a good man. <laughs> no, no, no. He can cook. He just can't cook well. He's capable of making food. It just doesn't taste very good. Kale followed Mita and Jim, dragging the meat shake on the cape. The passageway came to an abrupt end, opening into a chamber. Kale crouched in the tunnel, about halfway up one wall. In the center of the stone room, a sphere floated, smaller than the ones Kale had seen from a distance, hanging over the city of Vendela. This orb contained the two Kimmins. Kale caught her breath. Shimron and Cecil sat back to back, legs crossed, knees pulled up to their chins, eyes closed, and their own arms folded and resting on their knees. Their hair, hair fell limply around their shoulders and flowed to their feet. As still as stone, they looked like lifeless carvings. Kale examined the empty room. She could drop to the floor some six feet below her, but how would she reach the floating sphere? Can you fly to them? She asked her companions. The emphatic no surprised Kale. Shimmerin? Cecil? No response. Shimmerin! Cecil! Still no response. She wouldn't give up. Around the room, many tunnels led out of the chamber. If she could find something to aid her in one of those tunnels... She tied the blue scarf to the corners of the cape once more, slipped the makeshift sling onto her back, and sat down on the rock edge, preparing to jump to the ground. Excuse me. Her legs and feet felt cold, as if she had submerged them into Balzantor's pond near River Away. It must have something to do with whatever it is that floats the ball. Both Mita and Jim objected, tittering warnings about the room, but their thoughts came in overlapping rush. Kill couldn't sort them out, and she was in no mood to wait. She pushed off the shelf created by the end of the tunnel, and plunged into air as thick as water. She fell, but did not land on the floor. The meat egg thumped against her back. Kale bobbed upward like a cork on a fishing line. It felt so much like being in the pond, Kale instinctively clicked her legs and swam toward the so and swam toward the orb. She put both hands on the surface of the sphere and felt the transparent material give under her palms. She pushed harder, but 
did not break through. However, in response to her shove, the orb floated away from her. I wonder if I could get this ball back to Fenworth. He could probably open it. She looked back at the tunnel where Mita and Jim sat anxiously awaiting for her. That direction only takes me back to a tiny slit in the wall. She looked at the numerous other openings leading out of the small chamber. She made up her mind almost immediately. That one looks the right size in the right direction. Kale shivered against the cold air surrounding her. Best get moving before I freeze. She put her shoulders to the sphere and pushed, moving her legs in a strong, swimmer's kick. The meech egg dragged behind her, making her movements clumsy. Finally, she bumped into the wall above the tunnel she picked out. She pulled herself up to the top of the Kimmins' prison and sat on it to push it downward. After several tie tries, she pushed it into the rock opening. The sphere burst, spilling Shimmerin and Cecil onto the hard floor. A sparkling light filled the room for an instant. The Kimmins curled into balls, rolled over a couple of times, then sprang to their feet. They shook their heads, sending their already wild hair flying in all directions. Shimron placed his hands on his hips and surveyed his surroundings. Cecil squealed with delight and sprang across the expanse to hug Kale's neck. I thought you were dead. Kale laughed with relief. Cecil's warm body tickled a little. Why ever did you think that? asked Shimron. You were so still. We were waiting. Your lights weren't shining. Cecil giggled. You saw her underwear. Shimmerin gave his sister an impatient look. Kale wrinkled her brow, trying to remember what the stone-like figures of the two Kimmins looked like. Uh, I don't remember seeing anything but a lot of hair. That sent Cecil into another round of giggles accompanied by acrobatics. Shimmerin sighed. Kimmin's skin is very much like a covering, like a finely knitted stocking without seams. He scowled at Cecil. She quit prancing and stood in one place, but continued to quiver with glee. Shimmer and focused on Kale. Where are the others? Kale pointed across the room behind her. Jim and, Se Jim and Mita are waiting over there. Fenworth and the others are in her prison cell. Can you find them from here? Kale took a moment to get her bearings and locate Litu. She tilted her head toward the tunnel behind them. They should be down that way. But half these tunnels end abruptly, and you have to backtrack. The Kimmin leader nodded. Do you need help fetching the minor dragons? No. Then do so quickly. He could have said thanks. The, start the thought startled her. Had Risto said that? No. It was her own thought. Where was Risto all this time? Why was he so quiet and not pestering her? Kale dove into the room and swam across as easily as if she were swimming to the opposite shore of Bowsentor's pond. The dragons would not fly in the room, but rode back across on Kale's head. Their clawed feet dug into her scalp. They jumped off into the opening just as they reached it and stood huddled together looking fearfully at the now deserted chamber. Why do they find that place so dreadful? Kale asked. The heavy air would have clogged their tiny lungs said Shimmerin, but I didn't feel anything. No, you probably could have lasted an hour or more before you realized you were drowning. Kale looked back into the clear air and wondered what other hidden dangers they would encounter on this quest. She shifted the sling on her back and turned to follow the others down the passageway. The Meechig thrummed. A loud thrum. It vibrated her shoulder blades. It could be heard distinctly in the stone tunnel. It echoed and grew louder with each beat. Surely, every bison back in the region could hear the Meech Egg's contented thrum. <clears throat> That's why you don't have a boyfriend, because you can't find any guys that cook. Understandable. <laughs> I guess uh, if you get prerequisites, that's uh, not a bad one to have. Okay. We are going to take a quick break. We've got um, 
about 36 pages left to read. So hopefully we can still finish that tonight. Um, but we're going to take a quick break. And uh, I will be right back. super special tea called purple tea. Now, purple tea 
is a bit of a rare type of tea. It is technically a pu'er tea. It comes from a mother plant that was half pu'er. And okay, I'm back. Sorry, I've just gone so long that I decided to switch to a new video. <laughs> Talking one. Chapter 47. Which Way Out? A shimmering Cecil and Kale and the dragons approached the dungeon cell from one end of the long tunnel. Four bison, bar bison back guards approached from the other. We heard you coming, said Dar when they reached the cell. So did they, Kale answered, nodding to the burly men out of the prisoner's sight. Shimmerin dropped to one knee beside the locked door and placed his hands in a cup to receive his sister's tiny feet. Cecil stood on this makeshift boost and reached a hand inside the keyhole. In a moment, the door swung open. Lee Ark, Brunstetter, Dar, and Lee Tu jumped into the corridor with their weapons ready. The bison backs charged. Lee Tu slew the lead soldier with an arrow. Dar let fly two small daggers and downed another. Though Lee Ark and Brunstetter were massive, they moved with quick precision. The Marion and Urom dispatched the remaining two warriors in a brief flurry of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Is there a way to quiet that egg? Liark asked as he cleaned his blade before sheathing it. The egg's monotone thrum drowned, drowned out in the din of battle, now sounded loud in the rock corridor. It hung against Kale's back, gently vibrating. The Marion commander looked straight at Kale and she suddenly felt guilty. No, I mean, I don't know. She looked at Lee to Indar, both shrugged and looked to Fenworth. He shook his head and turned to his librarian. Well? The wizard cocked an eyebrow. I believe, said Liberat to wit. Kale is carrying the book containing a reference to Meatshags in her cape. Kale slipped the sling off her back and quickly located the books. She pulled out a heavy brown volume. Liberta Witt frowned and shook his head. No, smaller. He rejected each book Kale found until she reached her arm into the hollow up to her shoulder and recovered a small blue leather book with ancient yellowed pages. The librarian frowned as, she op as he opened it. Someone's been restoring these volumes. He leveled the glare at the Orant girl. Risky business. You could do a lot of damage. Kale shook her head and spread her hands in an innocent gesture. Not me. It was the cape. Liberta Witt carefully turned the fragile pages until he came to a passage of interest. He erumphed a few times as he read. I could send it to my castle, suggested Fenrith. No, said the Tremenhofer and scratched his brow. Use it to bake a cake and then do the spell, the backward spell, once we're out of this hideous mountain. No, said the Britowit, and squinted fiercely behind his spectacles. Lee Ark, Brunstetter, and Lee Tu stood at attention. Dar shifted from foot to foot. With big yawns, the minor dragons disappeared into their pocket dens. Fenris stroked his beard, dislodging a whole family of mice and a sparrow. Just as I feared. Liberta Witt said. What can we do? Asked the wizard. Nothing. Nothing? You went to university so that in t a time of crisis you could come up with nothing? Preposterous. We should have brought a plumber instead of a librarian. He turned to address the arc. I knew it at the time. 
But he mopes if you leave him at home. The Trimmenhofer's face went red behind his whiskers. With his book tucked under one arm, he stepped in front of the old wizard, and with a pointed finger jabbed him in the beard at waist level. I didn't want to come on this quest. I told you, I'm a librarian, not an individual given to questing. Fenworth bent forward and growled, You could have told me you were a plumber. I would have left a plumber at home. In fact, I did. I did leave the plumber at home and brought a librarian. Lebridowitz shook his fist in the wizard's face. You don't even know a plumber. Learc stepped forward, separating them. He stood between the angry men and patted each on his shoulder. If, if the boys and Becks don't hear the egg, they will hear you. I suggest we leave. Fenrir straightened and looked at the floor strewn with Bisonbeck warriors slain minutes before. Quite a good idea, actually. It's getting crowded down here. He looked down the dungeon corridor in both directions. Which way do you suggest we go, Wit? You've always had a good head for directions, especially underground. Lobritowitz signaled for the others to follow, and led them back the way Kale had come with Cecil and Shimmerin. As they passed the room where the orb had floated, Kale touched Litu's arm and whispered, I haven't heard Ristu's voice in my head for a long time. What do you suppose he's up to? He's up to capturing us again. You haven't heard him because the rest of us put a shield around you. How? The same way you blocked him with the words Granny Noon gave you. We knew you were in peril, so we kept up the block for you. You can do that? She nodded. Kale looked at her companions trudging through the tunnel, following the Trumanhofer. All of you? All of us in the cell. What did you say? We stand together under Walter's authority and offer a shield of protection from Risto's poisonous words around Kale's mind. And the words worked? The words didn't work, Kale. Walder worked. Another four Bisonbeck guards barreled down the corridor at them. Lee Ark and Brunstetter sprang in front of Lebridowit. Litu pushed Kale behind Dar and the wizard. Keep that egg safe, she ordered, and ran forward to enter the fray. The wizard char- changed into a tree. Dar stood ready with a dagger and his short sword drawn. The Bisonbecks did not break through the comrades' line of defense. Kale gingerly stepped over the legs of one of the fallen sol- warriors when Learc gave an- the all-clear, and Fenworth was persuaded to change back into himself. The sight of blood still made her queasy. The still forms of the dead soldiers looked capable of jumping up and resuming their fierce battle. Kale and the wizard fell into step together. Dar and the Kimmins guarded the rear, Lee Ark, Brunstetter, and Lee Tu followed directly behind Lebridowit, who seemed confident about his directions. Why can't you just whirl us out of here, Wizard Fenworth? Whirl? Whirl? What type of scientific activity is whirl? She decided not to let him distract her. Whirl, as in move people without regard to time or distance from one place to another, as when you whirled our party from the midways to your castle. Whirl, the useful action of a wizard in times of necessity. The wizard scowled at her with narrowed eyes, but kept walking. You didn't happen to pick up my walking stick now, did you? No, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. You didn't place it in your cape hollow? No, sir. Fenrith turned his attention to those in front of him. Kale peeked at the wizard's frowning face. He didn't look open to any more questions. They moved on. The egg thrummed. Kale shifted the light weight to the corner of her back. About the whirling out of the mountain? The walking stick would have been useful. You could put your hand on my shoulder, sir. He promptly clapped his wrinkled hand over Kale's blue scarf strap and gave her a gentle squeeze. They walked on, turning occasionally and once climbing two flights of stone steps. Soldiers in groups of four tried to stop them twice. She could sense the whereabouts of the underground populace. She knew Lebridowit was leading them to an uninhabited region. Wizard Fenworth, can you do something to get us out of here safely? You know, dear girl, 
You have a mind like your mother's. She held her breath, hoping the old man would say more. He took a deep breath, coughed a little, and squeezed her shoulder. The cape did not mend the items you put in the hollow. It didn't? Not by itself. She puzzled over the statement. I didn't do anything, sir. At least, I don't think I did. No. She tried to remember what she'd been thinking at the time. Something about doing something useful instead of sitting around in a daze. I don't think I did anything. You didn't happen to be wearing my hat. Oh no, I was. I wonder if it's a great crime to put on a wizard's hat on your head. I mean, if you aren't a wizard. If you're just a slave girl. I mean, a servant. There's no use trying to keep it a secret. Uh, yes, sir. I believe I did. Just to have my hands free to sort through the debris and pick things up. I, I didn't mean any disrespect, Wizard Fentonworth. The combination of the hats and the cape and your talents as an alaroid mended the broken items you put in the hollow. He patted her shoulder. I shall enjoy having an apprentice, I think. That is, if we get out of this mountain alive. About whirling, sir? Uh, about whirling, sir? No, Kale. <laughs> Chapter 48 Moving Heaven and Earth With each tunnel they turned into, the questing party moved, moved further away from the underground populace. No bison back guards challenged them after they entered a natural cavern deep in the mountain. The ceiling here vaulted high above their heads. The scattered tiny light rocks looked like stars in the night sky. A trickle of water ran in a meandering stream across the footpath. The travelers had to cross and recross as they followed the Brittawit. Clever, very clever, muttered Fenworth under his breath at regular intervals. What's he done? asked Kale looking ahead at the Tremenhofer librarian as he trod purposefully forward. Not he. Me. Fenworth leaned heavily on Kale's shoulder as they walked. Bringing a plumber would have been a total waste of time. Librarians are handy. Trumenhofer librarians, when you are under a Trumenhofer mountain, are especially useful. Where is he taking us? Who? Lebredowit. Out of the mountain. He knows the way? He's been here before? Lebredowit is a history buff. Knows about old mines. This is probably... This one probably hasn't seen a Trumenhofer pick in over a thousand years. Thing is, Wit knew it was here, and he knows where the gate is. Kel's shoulders straightened. A gate out of the mountain? Trumenhofer's like gates, and onions, and cheese, books of course, and, and mechanical things, handy in an agricultural way as well. Kel spoke quickly, trying to stop the wizard's flow of conversation before he got completely off track. Will there be Trumenhofer's at the gate? Wouldn't think so. They moved on, watching their footing on a particularly rough patch. Fenworth coughed, having some trouble clearing his throat. Do hope the gate's open. Likely to be shut, though. Trumenhofer's like things closed up and tidy. Old gate. Might not open if it's shut. Might not close if it's open. Fenworth had another fit of coughing. We'll stop here to rest. Learch gestured to a grouping of flat rocks that looked as if they might have been placed for people to relax and converse. It had the feel of the common room in Fenworth's castle. Kale sat next to the wizard and removed the sling from her back. The meechake thrummed steadily. She rested her arm over the bulky package of her cape and contents. The, me the minor dragons climbed out of their pocket dens and bl blinked at the surroundings. Once they saw the others in the party resting, they darted off to look for food. A cup of tea would be nice. Dar said as he eased himself onto a rock and stretched out his back. 
his hands cupped behind his neck. Black grime dimmed the bright yellow of the Daniel's clothing. His brocade jacket had a rip in the arm seam. Stains spattered his ragged pants, and scuff marks obliterated the high shine of his boots. Lee Ark and Brunstetter took out their weapons and began sharpening the blades. Kale shivered at the sight and looked over her shoulder. She could not sense anything lurking in the shadows. It had been quite a while since she had noticed the presence of any bison becks, either near or far. Litu sat down and pulled out an arrow. She fiddled with its feathers and then changed it for another. Kale wondered what she was doing. The Emerlindian look up, looked up at her. Kale, look in the things Granny Noon gave you. See if you can find Monsternbark. We can chew on that. Kale remembered the bumpy bark and Granny Noon's advice to use it when hungry. It has some nutritional qualities, the old Emerlindian had told her. But it's for the heart. It is much more helpful. The little bit of food you get from it will seem like much more, because it tastes good and refreshes your mouth. Kale dug in her cape and pulled out the packet. She got to her feet to pass the contents around. She put the last piece in her mouth and bit down. It tasted like a tea Mistress Miger brewed and then chilled to serve in the tavern on summer days. The cramp in Kale's stomach eased. She longed for the peaceful days of a slave, when she was often tired, often lonely, but never hungry. For a moment, Kale wondered if she would see the old Emerlindian Granny Noon or Mistress Miger ever again. That's not very profitable thinking. She chastised, she chastised herself and went to st sit with the librarian. Can you tell me if the gate was left open or shut? She asked him. He had taken off his clothes, his shoes. Oh, goodness. He had taken off his shoes and rubbed his feet with his broad-fingered hands. It was left cold, closed. I can read, I swear. It was left closed, but reports through the years indicate that the mechanism that triggers the opening and shutting has become unreliable. Thrum and half our gates are elaborate. The gate at the entrance of Dale is an example. Looks simple, but it requires a trained man like my cousin Bumby Bumblecore to open and close it after it has been set for the night. I remember the door in the gate made a lot of noise before it opened. Yes, well, the Bridewit looked down, embarrassed. Could have used some adjustments, or that racket wasn't strictly necessary, but I think it makes the gatekeepers feel important. Shows what a lot is going on while they're working to open the door. People standing outside are impressed rather than impatient if they think the gatekeeper is struggling with quite a few gears to allow their admittance. Kale nodded. How is the gate made? Will we be able to open it if it's shut? Libertowitz stared off in the distance for a moment before he answered. Yes, I'm hoping so. Thrummenhofer studied the great gates in school as youngsters. The ladder for this gate to the old mine is in the centre of a tunnel-like structure. When the gate closes, the middle of this corridor squeezes shut, so the gate looks like an hourglass on its side. The lever itself is not complicated, but the walls that move and twist in on the tunnel are intricate. A soft note from Dar's flute echoed through the large chamber, bouncing off rock walls ninety to a hundred feet high. He played a restful tune first. Mita flew to perch on his knee and joined him. They chose a rousing marching song next. When they were finished, Learc smiled at them and ordered everyone to get ready to move on. Libridowit couldn't get his shoes back on his swollen feet. Jim came and, with Kale, healed the ache and the swelling. Sorry for the delay, the Tremenhofer said. Librarians aren't used to being on the march, you know. Don't worry about it, friend, said the Marion commander. I'm not used to traveling with a healing dragon. It seems prudent for us to take a few more minutes here and allow Kale and her small friend to minister to us all. In a half an hour, while Mita and Dar provided music, Kale and Jim refreshed all the members of the party, except Shimron and Cecil, with a brief healing. The party fell in behind the Tremenhofer again, and they headed out. The minor dragons ran back and forth across Kale's shoulders in a game of tag, until she caught each one and put them inside the cape at her waist. She felt them burrow through the cloth folds to their pocket tins. 
How much farther? Leto asked Slimber to wit. Two more vaulted chambers, a twisty tunnel, and a main cavern. In the twisty tunnel, Kale's nerves began to zing. She caught up to Leto. I feel something. The Emerlindian nodded. Someone is following us. They walked on a few more minutes. Kale looked twice at all the shadows and over her shoulder repeatedly. Leto, I think there are hundreds of them. Wherever they are. Yes, they follow Risto's command to stop us before we leave the mountain. Shouldn't we tell the Ark? I already have. Oh. Kale looks at the Ark. He walked with the ner with every nerve on alert. Towering next to him, the Uro moved his head from side to side in constant vigil. Brenstetter? Li Tu nodded. And the Kimmins on Daw. What is it out there? Showergs. Shko Shkowergs. Kale closed her eyes for a moment. I am not going to be surprised. After all this, I should have known that Shkowergs weren't made up to scare little children into being good. I wonder if they look anything like how the old fairy tales describe them. She shuddered and opened her eyes. Now, she watched the shadows for something as tall as she was, wiry, covered with black fur, having a thick body, skinny arms and legs, huge yellow teeth, and small, beady eyes. They could crawl up and down walls like huge spiders. They could flatten themselves and slip through small holes. The questing party came out of the twisty tunnel and into a huge cavern. Across the expansive floor, a smaller tunnel led straight out of the mountain. Kale could see the round arch of daylight from where she stood. She could also feel the anticipation of a thousand fierce Skoergs waiting to attack. RUN! The Ark's command came a second before a screech cut through the cavern. In one moment, every surface on the wall behind them, and to the left, swarmed with rapidly moving dark, shaggy bodies. Brunstetter scooped Wizard Fenworth over his shoulder and took off across the open space. The meech egg bounced against Kale's back as she ran, almost as if it wanted to push her forward with its own panic. Lee Ark, Dar, and Lee Tu reached the entry to the gate tunnel a moment after the Kimmins. They all turned to face the enemy with their weapons ready. Brunstetter set Fenworth down and joined the line. The Britowit and Kale arrived last. Lee Ark's stern face turned to the Orant girl. Go through the tunnel, Kale. We'll hold them here. You will see the Orant town of Kringlin. Go there if we don't follow. Libertowit and the wizard held their heads together, arguing about the fireball spell. Necessary. No. <clears throat> there we go. Necessary, shouted Fenworth. Unreliable! The librarian countered in a voice twice as loud. Kale ducked into the tunnel and ran. Five yards ahead, the sun gleamed on new fallen snow. She looked back over her shoulder and saw Brunstetter's legs with the back of Leetu on one side and Dar on the other. The howls of the frenzied Skoergs followed Kale, sounding like a steady roar in the tunnel. Her ta toe caught an almost covered rod in the flooring, and she pitched sideways, slamming against the wall in a vertical metal bar. She fell flat on her face. Scrambling to her knees, she looked behind her at the floor. The lever! I knocked the lever down! She looked at the walls around her. Nothing's happening. It, it doesn't work anymore. Then the floor shuddered. The walls shivered. A, th a shrill, scraping noise filled the air around her. She sprang to her feet and bumped her head on the ceiling as it lowered and twisted. Her legs buckled under her as the ground also moved, rising and twisting. Running, crouching, falling, crawling... Kale made it out and fell into the snowbank. She flipped around and stared down the tunnel to a six-inch opening in the middle. The lever lay across the small hole on this side of the gate. They're trapped! Kale started back into the tunnel to lift the lever. The meat egg on her back hit the top of the shrunken tunnel. 
She backed up, ducked out of the cape sling, and left the egg and dragons in a bundle beside the entrance. She crawled into the tunnel. In a matter of a few feet, she had to lie on her stomach and wiggle closer to the lever. Through the small opening, she heard the clamor of battle. She came to a place too narrow for her shoulders, and she still couldn't reach the lever. She stretched one arm out ahead of her and wiggled just one inch closer. Her fingertips were two inches away from her goal. She pushed with her feet, her knees. She squirmed and gained an inch. I've got to reach it. They can't get out. She strained, scraping her shoulders against the rock. I have to move it. I have to. The lever jumped toward her. She clamped her fingers around it and pulled. It didn't give. She pushed. Nothing. She shook it back and forth, and the bar slid an inch to her right. She tried again, and it slurred further into the wall. The ground rumbled under her. The floor shifted to the side. Kale rolled. The gate began to open. As the circle widened, Kale saw the furious fight for survival playing out at the cavern into the tunnel. Flashes of light attested to the Kimmon's activity. Or was the wizard using the fireball spell? Kale heard swords cutting through the air with a whoosh and then thudding against tough, scoark bodies. Litu, Dar! The gate is open! Hurry! Her scream barely rose above the second rumbling of the rocks surrounding her. The stone wall next to her shattered and came down in a thick mass of gravel, sand, and fist-sized rock, fist rocks. The floor beneath her heaved upward. She slid back toward the outside of the mountain. Dar! Fenworth! A boulder crashed next to her and pinned her pant leg. Kale tugged frantically, tore the material, and clambered out of the tunnel. She tried to stand, but the rolling ground threw her back down on her hands and knees. With the dirt-encrusted sleeve of her blouse, she attempted to wipe dust from around her eyes. She turned and saw a fissure opening up behind her. The white snow tumbled onto the expanding rocky breach. The cape bundle slipped away from Kale and toward the crevice. No! Kale dove for the moonbeam cape and missed. Jim, Mita, fly to me, the eggs! Kale struggled through the snow, trying to catch up to the cape as it skidded toward the black gap. The mountain continued to stretch and break its boundaries. The ground underneath Kale gave way. She fell downward, with snow cascading on top of her, burying her. As soon as her feet touched something solid, she fought her way upward. When she surfaced, the cape and its contents had slid into a bush. The bare branches quivered with vibrations from the earth beneath it. Kale scrambled toward it, determined to snatch the prize from its limbs. The mountain quieted. The ground grew still. Kale hauled herself to her feet and plunged through the shifted snow. She stumbled but fell forward, and her hand caught the smooth moonbeam fabric. Crawling forward, she pulled with all the strength she had left. The tangle of winter branches held on like bony fingers. A shriek reverberated through the rocks beneath her, like the death wail of some hideous monster. The earth surged beneath her one more time, a rift opening right at her feet. The momentum of the mountain pitched her backwards, resting the cape from her hands. Cape and bush flew through the air in the opposite direction. Kale lay on her back, staring at the brilliant blue sky. A lone, white cloud peacefully floated above the tortured mountain. Turning away from the mockingly tranquil sky, the O-Rank girl sat up and crawled to the edge of the newly formed chasm. She reached with her mind to Jim and Mita. Emptiness. She tried to connect to the meat egg. A void. Tears streamed down her face. Voices brought her head around to stare at the misshapen entrance to the old Tremenhofer mine. Dar and Litu sat with a singed Fenworth propped between them. The Britowit lay stretched out with Brunstetter kneeling over him. Curls of smoke rose from his charred clothing. His fancy mustache and beard were stubble. The Kimmons examined the librarian with their usual speed and efficiency. Learc, bloodied and weary, limped toward Kale. You saved our lives, Orant girl. I lost the cape. She looked away from him and down the jagged sides of the gorge. Learc did not respond. She couldn't say she had lost the minor dragons, the meech egg, 
The words stuck in her throat behind a lump that cut off her breathing as well as her voice. A sob broke the stranglehold. She bent forward, weeping. The Marion's calm voice washed over her. We will build two leaders, litters for the wizard and the Trimenhofer. Aid will come from the Orent Valley soon. They will have noted the disturbance and send help. He left her and went back to take care of practical matters. Kale saw him leave through a blur of tears. They should go on without me. I don't want to go any further. I don't want anything. I failed. Oh, Jim and Mita, I failed you. Paladin, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Chapter 49 Home Orant hands lifted Kale out of the snow. Someone wrapped an Orant robe of fleecy wool around her bruised body. More Orant hands passed her with tender care onto the back of a blue and gold dragon. Orant arms carried her in the flight down the mountain to the valley. A citrus smell clung to the clothing of her rescuers. The sharp, slightly sweet fragrance had always been a part of Kale's bedding at home. Marion's had an earthy odor clinging to their bodies. Kale had noticed when she was quite young that her skin smelled different from the babies she rocked for the village mothers. Kale nestled against the strong chest of the Orant male, who cradled her, wrapped in a soft, citrus-smelling blankets. The sorrow in her heart wanted to bury itself in this sensation of being surrounded by something curiously familiar. Kale didn't want to figure it out. She didn't want to think too much. She closed her eyes and shut out the world. She awoke in a soft, warm bed in a room with painted walls and a rug that covered the floor. Warmth radiated from a crackling fire in a brick fireplace. A landscape painting in a gilt frame hung above an oak mantel. Curtains draped the windows. Sunbeams danced through multiple beveled panes of glass set in a finely carved sash. The room smelled of citrus. Kale sat up and looked out the window. Thick snow blanketed the countryside. Two stone walls topped with frothy caps marched marched down a straight country road. Bare-limbed trees in an orchard held aloft puffs of frosty snow. The sun sparked reflections on a myriad of tiny ice crystals covering every field, tree, bush, and building. Kale closed her eyes against the brilliant beauty. There should not be any beauty left in the world. Merry whistling and light footsteps announced the approach of someone beyond the polished wood door. A light tap, and then the sound of the door shushing across the plush carpet preceded a cheerful, Hello. An Elrant woman entered with a tray. The tray had legs to fit over Kale's lap. The woman wore a rich blue skirt with a matching short jacket, an ivory blouse underneath, and a lace cap on her head. She smiled with straight white teeth, looking pretty and natural in her pleasant face. A few wrinkles sprang out from her eyes and lips, as if they had been etched by years of friendly good cheer. Tea and toast? The woman walked briskly across the room. Then more sleep for you. You needn't get up today or tomorrow if you don't wish it. She set the tray down on the bedside table. Here, let me help you pile those pillows so you can sit up proper and eat a bite. She grabbed three pillows and stacked them against the headboard. Try that. She reached for the tray. My name is Mistress Scancy Morp. I am the head housekeeper here at Ornopy Pals. Kale sat back against the pillows, pulling the covers up around her waist. She stared at her hands. I'm clean. She held out her arm and inspected the delicate linen nightshirt sleeve. How... Oh, you were exhausted all right when you came in late yesterday afternoon. Scancy Morp filled, fit the tray over her guest's legs and poured a cup of tea. She dipped two spoonfuls of fine white sugar into the brew and stirred vigorously. The silver spoon chimed against the porcelain. You don't remember soaking in the warm tub? Kale shook her head. Drink that now. It has herbs to help you sleep and heal. 
Mistress Morp sat on the chair and watched as Kale picked up the cup and took a sip. The lace cap bobbed on the housekeeper's head as she nodded her approval. You were chilled clear through. All of you were. Your wizard has caught cold. The Trimmenhofer has broken legs, cuts and bruises, the like I've never seen on all your friends. But they're on the mend. We have good doctors here in the valley. The Brita will have to curtail any adventuring for some time, but he doesn't seem to mind. He's been mumbling about books and was right pleased when I had a footman carry books up from Master Onope's library. The Trumenhofer gentleman cannot sit up yet, but he seems comforted to have a stack of, sick, of thick tones on his bedside table. He's a librarian. Kale spoke around a mouthful of toast. So I have been informed. Although he does not go, also that he does not go questing. Your wizard is a very old man. I don't think it was the wisest thing for him to have gone questing either. But wizards have remarkable stamina. Let's hope rest and good food will be enough to cure him. Dar? The Doniel? At Kale's nod, she smiled. Oh, I love a nice Doniel. They are such pleasant house guests. He's busy replenishing his wardrobe called for material and thread. His feet were injured, and he had a gaping wound in his back. Kale gasped. Not too bad, Mistress Morp assured her. More than a scratch. Less than it could have been. He's content to putter around his room until he has time to put together some suitable clothing. Thex552, thank you for the follow. Glad you're enjoying the stream thus far. Hope you continue to enjoy. And welcome to the dark side. How you doing tonight? Okay. She hopped up to replenish Kale's empty teacup. Your other friends are sleeping. Even the Kimmins. At least, I assume they're sleeping. They take care of themselves, you know. I did get to serve them some of my sweet cakes and a berry juice I put up last summer. Such dear little creatures. Litu Benz is all right? The Emerlindian? Yes. She's sleeping, which is what you should be doing. You're getting drowsy, aren't you? Kale nodded and raised a hand to cover a tremendous yawn. Mr. Smorp smiled with satisfaction and took the tray. You cuddle back down, and when you awake, I'll have a nice bowl of chuck a -joop for you. Kale slid under the covers, knocking two of the pillows aside in the big bed. Star once told me chuck a -joop is the Orant national dish. I've never had any. Mrs. Morp chuckled. Well, if we had a national dish, I guess chuck a -joop would be it. She pursed her lips in a comical moo. Daniels love to tease, and they make good friends. You are fortunate to have him among your companions. He's been worried about you. Regret intruded on Kale's comfort. She hadn't been a very good friend to any of her companions. This room, the food, the good housekeeper's kind attention, none of it should be wasted on her. I don't deserve to be treated so well. Mistress Morp frowned fiercely at her young charge. In this house, we don't wait for someone to deserve to be treated decently, my dear. Her voice had a hard edge, and Kale realized she had in some way offended the woman. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... Mistress Morp's expression softened. No, dear, I'm the one to apologize. I forgot you haven't been taught the ways of the Orants. But that will change now. You can stay with us as long as you like. Master Onopi has already said he'd take you in as one of his daughters. He's a generous man, and your story touched his heart. My story... Kale struggled against the sleep that pulled her away from Mistress Morp's words. Who told him my story? Why, Paladin, dear. He was among those who went out to rescue you. Paladin? Kale tried to sit up again, but she could not even keep her eyes open. Tears slipped down her cheeks. She didn't want to face Paladin. He would be so disappointed in her. Rest, dear, and heal. The shush of the door opening and closing over the carpet followed Mistress Morp's soft words. I need more tea.
A tangy smell of something delectable pulled Kale out of a deep sleep. The fire crackled and sparked, warming the room with its golden glow as well as a pleasant heat. In the chair where Mistress Morp had sat earlier, a man rested, his head against the high cushioned back, his long legs extended straight out with polished black boots crossed at the ankle. Kale blinked and looked curiously as the fire played a flickering light over his features. Paladin, she sat up abruptly. He opened his eyes slowly, and a gentle smile spread across his lips. Little Kale, it's good to hear your voice. He reached for a bowl on the table at his elbow. Mistress Morp sent up chuck a jupe. I'm partial to this stew myself, and Mistress Morp makes some of the best I've ever tasted. Kale crossed her legs under the blanket as she took the thick ceramic bowl into her hands. It fit in one, and warmth spread through those fingers as she picked up the spoon with the other hand. Hunger rose up at the smell of the rich, dark stew. She took a mouthful and savored the flavor. I do like it. You sound surprised. Dar said it was made of things from underground, only roots and things. Daniels. Paladin shook his head gently. The grin on his face widened. Kale took another bite and peered into the bowl. There was not enough light for her to see it, it for her to see it very well. He also said it was blood red. A dark candle on the table sizzled. The unlit wick suddenly burst into flame. Paladin picked it up and held it over Kale's bowl. It is. Kale grinned up at Paladin. The broth is red. Eat it, Kale. It's good for you. Paladin sat comfortably stretched out in his chair while she ate the entire bowlful and scraped the last drops out of the bottom with her spoon. She handed the empty bowl to him, and he put it down on the table. Only then did it strike her as appalling that Paladin himself had served her and sat quali quietly beside her while she ate. She hadn't even offered him polite conversation as the Marion's did around their fancy tables with important guests. Now, Kale, his voice held a note of, of reprimand, we've been very comfortable together. Why have you gone tense, and why do you look ill? Did the chuck not sit well in your stomach? She knew the last question was a jest. It sounded very much like something Dar would say. Of course, the delicious Sue had not made her sick. Kale looked down at her hands folded in her lap. What does he want me to say? What should I say? Only two words came to mind. I'm sorry. Sorry? He quirked an eyebrow at her. Jim and Mita are dead. I know what happened to Jim and Mita. I lost the meat shake. I know what you did. I hit the lever and made the gate close. When I opened it again, it fell apart. Everything fell apart. I know. I didn't do one thing right, and Jim and Mita are dead. Wolder is in charge of life in our world, Kale. He gives it, and he takes it away. And when he takes life from one of his creatures here, where we stand, he moves it with his infinite care to another place we know very little about. You were mi not mighty enough to be in charge of the giving and taking of life. Not your life, not Jim's life, not Mita's life. Kale scrubbed the tears off her cheeks with the back of her hand. Paladin offered her a handkerchief. Blow your nose, he ordered kindly. The noise embarrassed Kale, but everything about being with Paladin now embarrassed her. He should be wiz visiting with Wizard Fenworth or Litu or Dar, not her. Paladin reached out and took her hands in his. He leaned forward and smiled a small, tender smile that somehow warmed her with love and peace. I want to visit with you, Kale. You are more than my servant. You are my friend, my child, my vision of the future. She shook her head slowly from side to side. Paladin could not be wrong. But what he said didn't make sense. She was a slave girl who didn't even follow orders very well, who didn't do the right thing, who caused all sorts of problems, who caused terrible things to happen. Kale, 
What happened when you first found the Matrig and you tried to walk away? I was stuck. Paladin nodded. Sometimes we cannot walk away from our responsibilities. What happened when you left the cape and re-entered the tunnel to open the gate? Oops. Nothing. I mean, the meat shake didn't hold me. Sometimes, the order of importance of our responsibilities shifts. What was crucial at one moment moves down to second place, or third, under different circumstances. Kill wrinkled her brow, trying to understand. Paladin squeezed her hand. What do you think Wolder wanted you to do? Sit and cradle the meat shake? Or try to help your friends? Help? Paladin nodded. You did the right thing, Kale. You didn't sit and reason it out. You jumped up and did the right thing. You are a better person than you think. Walder is pleased with who you are. But it was my fault. You have the power to crack a mountain in two. Amazing. I thought you were just a slave girl. The twinkle in his eye took away the sting of his words. A smile played at the corner of Kale's mouth. I guess not. You have choices to make now, Kale. Paladin let go of her hands and leaned back into his chair. You can return with Dar to the hall, or you can stay here in the Orant Valley. Either choice is all right with me. If you go to the hall, you will be trained, and much will be required of you. If you stay here, you will learn more about your people. Things will come across your path that will require you to help friends and even strangers. Paladin signed and leaned, sighed and leaned back in the chair. He looked perfectly content and at ease, not troubled by wicked wizards and all the evil they created. It is quieter here. The likelihood of adventure is less, but still, you will be my servant. I will be pleased with you. You are mine, Kale, and I do not scorn those who have given their service to me. You won't be bored here, either. There will be plenty of opportunities to do good. You don't have to decide tonight. In fact, you can wait until spring. He stood up and stretched. Kale watched him. His strong body, silhouetted by the fire, looked much like that of any young man. Yet Paladin had been around since before the Battle of Ordre. Her eyes widened at the thought. Wizard Fenworth was that old, too. Paladin was special in ways Kale could not understand, and he had claimed her as his friend, his child. She looked down at her callous and scratched hands. She didn't seem a good candidate for service at the hall. I didn't much like questing, she said, barely above a whisper. Whisper. Paladin nodded. He didn't look surprised or upset over her admission. Kale remembered Fenwith's words. Questing is often uncomfortable. Paladin smiled, and Kale knew he recognized the wizard's thinking. Unpredictable, he added. Kale nodded, looking into his eyes and knowing he would not condemn her for her choice, no matter what it was. She left, carrying the empty bowl. Kale got out of bed and sat in the window seat, gazing out at the peaceful countryside. Its blanket of fresh snow glowed under a full moon in a clear sky. There must be a million stars in that sky. The Britowitz said that Wolder knows each of their names. Paladin knows my name, so does Wolder? She tucked her chilly toes beneath the long nightgown. I don't have to decide tonight. I don't have to decide until spring. The days that followed gave Kayla the most wondrous taste of belonging. She sat with Ornipi's girls and, dis and learned to sew at Dar's instruction. The Britowit regaled them with stories, with hours of stories, and taught them history. They danced with the Kimmins and did chores with Mistress Morp, and the chores were not drudgery but fun because of the companionship. The Britowit and Fenworth told legends and tales of old. Lee Tu and Dar demonstrated juggling feats. Everyone gave it a try, but only ended up laughing more than catching the objects thrown in the air. Brunstetter and Lee Ark knew an astounding number of games. Members of the household and guests played every afternoon in the light of the sunroom. Contented, Kale took pleasure in each moment as she spent er each moment she spent as a part of this happy entourage. The days lengthened. 
Crocus and spring buds poked their colorful heads through the last of the snow. Birds flew back into the Orant Valley from the south and began nest building. Lambs, calves, and colts frolicked in the pastures. Kale made her decision. One day, when the breezes chased pu away puffy clouds that had sprinkled in the newly sown fields, she looked at the broken slopes of the shorter peak of Torbernot and sighed. There's one thing I must do first, she said to the empty road. I must go find the meat egg, or what's left of it. She did not look over her shoulder at the massive bright walls of Ornipee Halls. She didn't go back to gather provisions from the ample supply of kitchen cupboards. She wrapped the shawl she'd knitted at Mistress Morp's hearth around her shoulders. She set her eyes upon her goal and started the long walk back to the wrecked entrance of the abandoned Tremenhofer mine. Mine. Chapter 50 Standing Together Muddy waters swirled in the streams coming off the mountains. With the spring thaw, melted snow washed down the slopes, creating rivulets that ran together, making tumbling books and swift, quiet rills. White mountain dewdrops, tiny flowers on moss-like plants, cover the ground. The smell of new grass, damp earth, and sweet dewdrops filled Kale with exuberance. She climbed rapidly, using paths well-worn by shepherds and their flocks. As the sun began to sink to the west, she stopped and surveyed the countryside now spread below her. Sighing, she sat on a boulder and gazed with contentment at the valley of the Orants. She easily picked out Ornipee Halls, three beautiful buildings, with an elegant wrought iron fence around them, and a straight road running out its front gate. It's been home to me, if I'd never had a home before, or as if I'd never had a home before, but Paladin put a claim on my heart as well as my life. I want to go to the hall. She stood and began the more arduous climb up broken granite and shifted crags. The cool mountain air penetrated her clothing. Shivering, she wished she'd brought something a little more practical than the shawl. Granny Noon's moonbeam cape always kept my body warm. I must find the cape and the eggs. Her foot slipped on some loose rocks. Some of the pebbles fell into her boot. She sat down to remove it and shake out the debris but as soon as her backside touched the ground, she sprang up again. Kale frowned and bent to sit down. Her legs straightened, and she took two more steps up the mountain. Every muscle in her body strained to go forward. The eggs! I'm being pulled to the eggs! She gave a whoop and grinned. I'll find them. I can't help but find them. Kale climbed more vigorously while the sun went down and the moon rose. She reached a flattened area that looked vaguely familiar. When she spied the twisted entrance to the Trimmenhofer mine, she knew why. She turned her back on the gaping black mouth and headed to the cliff where the moonbeam cape and its press precious contents had slept over the edge. Bright moonlight cast the region in a stark contrast of light and shadow. To the right was a slope of boulders, which might be easier to descend than the spot at Kale's feet. She took a few steps in that direction. A light at the bottom of the crevice caught her attention. A glowing cloud hovered at the base of a rock slide. It constantly shifted. The edges grew thin and drifted into nothing. The center remained unchanging, a roundish mass of eerie green light. I don't much like the works of that looks of that. Kel spoke her doubts, even as her feet moved toward the easier descent and mysterious luminescence. The day's walking and climbing, the lack of food, and the cold night air began to wear on her. She tried singing some of Dar's marching songs to keep alert. She struggled to slow down against the ever-increasing strength of the Meechake's pole. She mumbled to herself, Making your way down a crevice side is no place to fall asleep on your feet. An almost forgotten nudge in her mind caught her off kilter. She sat down with a thunk on a hard, jagged rock. Ouch! Even the pain couldn't disguise the persistent niggling in her mind. Jem? She stood up. Jem! Kale moved cautiously down the rocks. 
Jem's thoughts, and then Mita's bombarded her. She wouldn't go to sleep now, but she also found it hard to concentrate on where to safely put her feet. Slow down. I'm not understanding at all. You're all right, and so is Mita. The meat shake is fine. The worm is a nuisance. Worm? Kale shuddered as she got Jem's impression of the worm. Big, slimy, slowly stalking them. Kale caught the image of the two minor dragons picking up rocks and flying over a massive round worm. They dropped the rocks on the squirming beast, pelting it to scourge its, its advance, and the worm slithered back into the rock walls. According to Mita's account, this happened often. They also sped on the creature, leaving green and purple splotches that hurt the worm and caused it to turn back. It's so very dumb and very persistent. Kale chuckled at Jim's tirade. And you were- oh. It's- so it's very dumb and very persistent. Kale chuckled at Jem's tirade. And you're glad I'm coming, because you and me are tired of it. It was so good to have those choppy, chaotic thoughts of the minor dragons flitting through her thought patterns. Kale laughed out loud. She learned Mita and Jim had spent a comfortable winter in a cave that boasted three hot springs and plenty of insects and small rodents. The minor dragons knew she would come to get them. They had felt it their duty to protect the meat shake from the worm. The mention of the worm sent Jem off on another lengthy description of the clumsy beast's constant stalking. Apparently, when it captured a victim, the worm surrounded it and went to sleep, absorbing the captive directly through its oozing skin. Kale grimaced with distaste. Clearly, the wor this worm was an undesirable creature to winter within a cave. She reached the bottom of the ravine. Broken rocks littered the floor. She picked her way through the gl glowing mist. The air smelled musty and unpleasant. It stung her eyes as she passed through. On the other side, a gap in the rocks gave entrance to the cave where Jem and Mita guarded the meat egg. Kale heard its thrum, deep, constant, and strong. As she entered the chamber behind the mist, steamy air clung to her skin. Streaks of light rock material but mottled the cavern walls, giving off an even blue light. Jim and Mita flew to greet her. Tears of joy slipped down Kale's cheeks. She uttered a praise of thanksgiving to Walder as she cuddled each little dragon's slim body against her face. She walked with them on her shoulders and collapsed beside the bush holding her cape and the meech egg. There she gently rubbed the two dragons' scaly backs until, until she felt calm and rested. As Mita sang a song of rejoicing, Kale's spirit revived. The small piece of her heart that had been discontent, even while she enjoyed the company of her own people, now felt at peace. Jim's healing touch took away her aching fatigue. Before sitting down for the night, she carefully broke away the dead branches of the bush that ensnared the cape and egg. She explored the pockets and found all six unhatched dragon eggs safe. She delved into the hollows and discovered treasures from her travels and from Granny Noon. She wrapped herself in the moonbeam cape, and the sticky heat of the cavern no longer bothered her. Mita assured her she could drink the spring water, so she drank her fill. At long last she lay down, curled herself around the thrumming meat jag, and let its soft vibrations lull her to sleep. The minor dragons would take turns watching throughout the night against the visit from the worm. Kale woke to Mita bouncing on her shoulder and chirping a warning. Sunlight filtered into the cave. Kale saw clearly the huge worm was slowly advancing across the open space. Worms on a fish hook had never been a lovely sight. A worm the size of six cows walking A worm the size of six cows walking one behind the other made Kale sit up and stare. Pinkish gray flesh undulated as the creature inched forward. It moved sluggishly, rippling and sliding toward a tree near one of the hot springs. Hello, Kepasa, how are you doing tonight? Kale blinked at the sight of the stubby tree. She didn't remember it from the night before. A tangle of long moss hanging off one side caused her to sit up even straighter and squint at the thick limbs. Wizard Fenworth! Mita and Jem left her and flew to the tree. They circled Fenworth, chittering in high-pitched squeals. 
Kale stood and grabbed a long branch she had broken off from the dead bush the night before. She charged the worm, hitting its head. It recoiled and turned away. Its retreat was slow and cumbersome. Well, if I have to face an enemy alone, that worm will do. Jim landed on her shoulder and scolded. Excuse me, said Kale. Of course I wasn't alone. Fenris stretched and began to look more like a wizard. He yawned and shook his head. His hair and beard flew about him. Tut, tut. Shouldn't sleep at my up sitting up at my age. Puts cricks in my shoulders. Good morning, Wizard Fenworth, said Kale. Did you follow me yesterday? Follow you? The wizard harumphed. I didn't follow you, my dear. I led the others. Kale looked around the cave. No one looked in the shadows as far as she could see. Where are they? Fenworth glanced around in puzzlement. Oh dear, where did I put them? No, no, I remember. I came on ahead. Got tired of walking. He watched the tail end of the worm disappear through one of the many cracks in the cave walls. What a dreadful existence. Makes one glad one's a wizard. Yes. Being a wizard is much preferable to being a worm. Kale recognized the voice before she turned to see Wizard Risto. Amazed, she realized how closely the evil man resembled Paladin. They were about the same build, and had the same coloring and similar facial features. He stepped into the cave from where he stood by the entrance. But being a wizard who has taken his destiny into his own hands is infinitely preferable to being a wizard who lives to please another. Tut tut. Fenris shook his head and stood and slowly stood. Shaking out his robes, he dislodged a lizard and a mouse. As always, leaves fluttered to the ground as he walked over to Kale and put a hand on her shoulder. He means me, you know. Not the first part, the destiny in his own hands part. The second part, about pleasing. He shook his head again. I don't think Risto has ever given me a compliment before. And really, I should compliment him back. Polite, you know. But I can't think of anything nice to say. Oh dear. Risto sneered at Fenworth. Kale saw any resemblance to Paladin melt away. Where compassion and wisdom enhanced Paladin's face to make him attractive, Risto's contempt shadowed his face with hard, ugly lines. Wizard Fenworth leaned closer to Kale's ear. He had to wait for you to show up, you know. Couldn't find the meat egg on his own, even when it was at his back door, so to speak. He hasn't the talent for finding dragon eggs as you do, my dear. Galls him. He wants to be all-knowing, all-powerful. Galls him that a mere Orant girl can find the meat egg, and he can't. Had to follow you. Galls him. An angry guttural growl emanated from the evil wizard. Hand over the meat egg, old man. Oh, I couldn't do that. He looked at Kale. Perhaps Kale would like to. Kale found that she was too scared to speak. She shook her head. No, said Fenworth sadly. I didn't think so. You're no match for me, Fenworth. No match. Haven't got a match. I've got a good fire spell, but the Ritwit doesn't like me to use it. Librarians can be incredibly picky about details. Risto took a step forward and roared, Fenworth! Yes? You bore me with your prattle. Oh, regrettable that. Why don't you go seek the company of someone who doesn't prattle? Seems like a good solution to your problem. Enough of this nonsense. Risto marched across the cave. Kale ran. She flung herself over the egg and cringed, expecting to feel Risto's large hands grab her and hurl her out of his way. Instead, she heard laughter. The soft chortle of Dar and Litu, the shimmering giggles of Kimmons, and the bark of hearty laughter from Brunstetter and Lee Ark. Foiled again? The Britowitz voice bubbled with merriment. Kale looked toward the entrance of the cave. Her friends filed in, 
and came to stand with Fenworth. "'You're late!' said the wizard. "'Ran into an angry group of Grawlicks,' said Lee Ark. Kale rolled off to the egg and sat with a thump on the hard cave floor. "'Why didn't he grab the egg?' The Brutowick came to her side. He extended a hand and helped her to her feet. "'You were between him and what he wanted, and your pal and servant.' "'I'm not a very powerful servant.' "'Doesn't matter. He wasn't prepared for resistance.' The librarian looked over at the frustrated wizard. Risto's face had, tur face had turned dark with rage. His eyes bulged as he glared at the line of opposition. "'No, I think he is prepared.' Let's go stand with our comrades. Kale stayed close to the Schumannhofer's side. Will there be a battle? More a contest of wills. For the first few minutes, Kale thought nothing was happening except a lot of staring. Then she noticed her friends fading. At first the colors of their clothing became pale, and then she could see through them like a mist. She no longer watched Risto, but stared in horror as one by one her comrades disappeared to be replaced by a gleaming green cloud, like the one at the cave entrance. My little friend, Kale Alleroyne. Kale looked up at Risto and saw his expression had changed. Now he looked again very much like Paladin. This has been a trial for you, but you have passed. You are worthy of being my follower. You're Risto. Of course I am, dear Orad's girl. I am sorry for all the confusion. It was necessary to make sure you were the last of the Alaroins, and not some impostor. I don't understand. The Alaroins have always worked with me. You were stolen from us at birth. We welcome you back. Kale looked to her friends to see the reaction to this news. She saw nothing but glowing mist shapes. They might not have heard him mind speak anyway. That's right, Kale, because they aren't really there. You stand alone. You always have. You have no friends. It was all an illusion I created. I've gone to a lot of trouble to draw you into our family circle. And I'm not the only one who awaits your arrival. In her mind, Kale saw a castle turret with an orient woman sitting by the window, gazing longingly across a forest. Kale fought a panic rising in her chest. I have cared for you ever since I met this woman who loves you. Risto's voice in, his Kale, in Kale's head caressed her loneliness with warm, soothing tones. I have kept you safe when I could and agonized when you had to suffer. You must see that to come with me will make not only me happy, but you as well." Kale looked into Risto's face. He looked so like Paladin, except for a hard glitter in his eyes, stern lines of disapproval around his mouth and the tight, angry line of his jaw. Believe in me, Kale. I will teach you the wonders of your powers. No one else can give you the answers you need, because no one is like you. I am the perfect guardian for you, Kale. No one wants to help you as I do. No one can but me. I would be greatly distressed if anything happened to you, and if you leave me, I am afraid disaster will befall you. You would be destroyed. There is no doubt about that. Make the wise decision, Kale. Go, pick up the meat egg, and come. Kale remembered Pretender had told the Kimmins that he had mastered their weather and had the power to destroy them. He had lied. She remembered Leithu saying that when Risto lied, it sounded like truth. She remembered Granny Noon's advice. I stand under Walder's authority. Kale spoke the words aloud. Risto grimaced. Her friends appeared, with not even a wisp of the gleaming clouds clinging to their clothes. Mita sang. Her song soared with praise. Its trills and runs echoed off the stone walls. Shimmerin and Cecil twirled in place, and then began to dance. 
Dar pulled out his trumpet and blasted the air with a triumphant call. We still glared at them all. We won? Kale asked Labridowit under her breath, keeping her eyes on the volatile wizard. He nodded. He tried to weaken each of us with evil words in our minds. We all stood firm in our allegiance to Paladin. Fenworth put a hand on Kale's shoulder. Caution, my dear. Do not assume. Tut, tut, my dear librarian. I think you spoke too soon. Look at our enemy's demeanor. Kale glanced at Fenworth's serious face. Then her eyes went back to the evil wizard. The man shook with anger. As each second passed, the tension in his body escalated. The energy of his hatred radiated from his eyes. Kale wanted to duck behind someone. Fenworth and Labridowit, who were wise, Learc, Litu, and Brunstetter, who were strong, the Kimmons and Dar, who somehow always gave comfort by their presence. Kale hoped Paladin would walk through with the glowing mist at the cave entrance and banish Risto. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the giant Urom scoop up the meech egg and cradle it protectively in his arms. The stone floor quivered under Kale's feet. The air around the wicked wizard crackled. Rage poured out of his body into the small cavern. Vibrations of malice intensified, and the rock walls began to shake. Kale trembled, but she couldn't tell if it was fear within that made her shake, or the undulating world around her. "'Come close now,' ordered Fenworth. "'Time for an exit. I think we'll whirl. Kale likes to whirl. Hold hands. Let's stay together, children. I want no one lost.' Mita and Jim flew to Kale, darted under the edge of the moonbeam cape, and burrowed into their pocket dens. Excuse me. At the same time, her comrades gathered around Fenworth. A blinding light burst into the cave. A roar of anger filled her ears, and gradually diminished, as if a distance was growing between her and the one who roared. Risto had been left behind. Destination? Fenworth's voice came to her, although she could not tell where he was. She held someone's hand. She thought it was Dar's, small and slightly furry. A racing wind buffeted her. Oh dear, oh dear, we're being followed. The fierce cries of wild animals surrounded them. Sharp teeth nipped at Kale's heels. She could not open her eyes to look, and yet she could see in her mind the black shapes of huge hounds racing behind, beside them. Their red eyes pierced her soul and made her want to scream in terror. Throaty snarls raked across along her nerves, and the air filled with a fetid smell of rancid meat. Detour! Fenrith exclaimed, and the next moment water splashed against Kale's legs, soaking her trousers and boots. The water stung small wounds at her ankles inflicted by the hound's teeth. Even through closed eyes, Kale cinched the brilliance around her fade, the air turned bitter cold. Some barrier now muffled the sound of the wind. She peeked, but wasn't able to make out any shapes nearby. She couldn't even pick out the form of the one holding her hand. Oh dear, oh dear, I need help now. All of you stay together and call on Walder. How do I call on Walder? Just talk to him? A streak of blackness hurtled past Kale's right ear, sizzling the air and burning the side of her face. Oh, Walter, I don't know if Fenworth is wise enough, or any of us strong enough to get out of this mess. Please, help us. In the distance, she heard dragon wings flapping against the air. She heard cattle lowing and blackbirds screaming and warning of the intrusion. The light intensified again, and she squeezed her eyes shut. The wind whistled. Fenworth chuckled. Reinforcements! Ah ha ha! Now, where was it we were going? Reinforcements? What? Where? Again, her mind captured an image her eyes could not see. White-winged dragons, the dragons themselves of a multitude of colors. Men in shining armor. Paladin on a great shining dragon. Weapons that blazed. Too many forms in the darkness for her to count. They drove away dark, swift shapes and gave chase. Kale felt as though she was being dragged through bushes. She lost her grip on the hand she held, and felt an odd, cylindrical structure form under her, so that she was straddling it in midair. The wind ceased. The light faded. 
Kale opened her eyes to view her surroundings. She and her companions sat on the branches of a towering Traganog tree. Close by stood an Orant farmhouse, a barn, and a wagon. In the distance, Ornipi Hall stood elegantly basking in the bright spring sunshine. Fenworth looked around anxiously. Most uncomfortable. Did we lose anyone? Head count! Lee Ark, Lee Two, and Brunstetta, three? Should we count the meat egg? No, I think not. Don't drop it, Brunstetta. I'm to take that home and raise it. Ridiculous. Being a parent at my age. Where were we? Oh yes, three. One Orant, two Kimmins, two Minor Dragons, eight. A Librarian and a Diplomat, ten. We're missing one. Who's the Diplomat? Uh, Kale asked Libertowit, who sat on the branch above her. Dar, Doniels are often considered quintessential ambassadors. He cleared his throat and raised a hand to catch Fenworth's attention. You forgot to count yourself. The wizard bristled. Nonsense! I'm the oldest, so I counted myself first. You're the oldest, and you didn't count yourself at all. Three Mongol dogs charged from the open barn door, barking furiously. They surrounded the base of the tree. One stood with front paws against the smooth, olive-green trunk and issued a challenge to the interlopers in the tree. Another leapt in the air, snapping at Brunstetter's heels, dangling just above its jaws. The third raced pell-mell around the base of the tree and furiously barked its opinion of anyone who dared enter its territory in such an unconventional manner. The farmer and his wife appeared in the door of their home and gazed with amu amazement at the scene in their front yard. "'Bring a ladder, man!' commanded Fenworth. "'We return! The conquering heroes!' The farmer's wife nudged her dumbfounded husband. He nodded to her and darted for the barn, coming out a minute later with a long ladder under his arm. Kale turned to Dar, sitting in the clump of broad, tragonog trees on another branch. "'What happens next?' We celebrate, and we go home. The words sounded as sweet to Kale as music. Home. Not to the Ornipi Halls, but to the Hall. The Hall in Vendella. Paladin's Hall. Epilogue. Almost there. Dar traveled with her. Paladin had given him permission to enter the Hall and train for service. Vizi and Deshay had flown with the large dragons over the mountain pass as soon as the weather permitted. Merlander and Selyse carried Dar and Kale on the lengthy journey south along the Morchain r Range. When they reached an area Kale recognized, she insisted they land beside the trade road. This is where I left Farmer Briggs' wagon, Dar. She stood beside the bustling road and stared across the valley at the beautiful city of Vendella. M Mita and Jim flew around her head in excitement. They touched down on her shoulders, only to take off again, chittering to one another and turning loops in the air. Spring had come and gone. The approaching summer solstice feast day had brought many travelers to Vendela, capital of Amara. The sun sparkled on the city's sheer white walls, shining blue roofs and golden domes. Spires and steeples and turrets towered above the city in a vast variety of shapes and colors. More than a dozen castles clustered outside the capital, and more palaces were scattered over a hilly landscape on the other side of a wide river. "'This time I'm going in,' said Kale to her companions. "'This time I'm not afraid of the proddings in my mind that say there are too many new things in Vendella for me to even count.' She felt again the pulse of the city, the many minds filled with their own thoughts and spilling into her consciousness. She easily blocked the torrent, controlling the flood of humanity and retaining her own identity. Her mind-speaking talent no longer made her uneasy. This time, I'll be able to ask questions and get answers. I'll learn about Wolder and Paladin, and I'll learn more about me as well. I may even learn about the Alaroins. She put her hands on her hips and sighed with pleasure. We're almost there. Almost there is not there. Come on, let's go. Dar said as he walked back to Merlander. This time tomorrow, you'll have your Leesent uniform. Leesent? What's Leesent? 
the lowest rank in paladin service. Not that you'll be treated badly for being the lowest, not in paladin service, but... Wait, are you saying that I'll be Lee St. Kale? Sure. And Lee Ark? The Lee means... Highest rank. Actually, he's a General Lee Ark. Higher than Major Lee Ark. Lee, or Plain Lee. M Lee too? Two steps down from Lee. Didn't you know that, Kale? Kale shook her head slowly. Master Mager was right. I don't know anything. She grinned, grinned at her Doniel friend. <laughs> but I'm learning. Tonight, she'd sleep at the hall. Tomorrow, she'd wear a lecent uniform. There was a festival to see, and she had teachers to meet, classes to t attend, a life to live. Kale ran across the little hillside and jumped onto Salisa's saddle. Let's go! And that is the end of Dragon Spell. So, I'm still leaving the, uh, um, straw poll for what book I will be reading next. Um, starting, excuse me, next week. If anyone is in chat and has not uh, voted, there's a link there where you can vote. Uh, currently, it looks like Artemis Fowl is uh, fifty percent, so it's it's definitely in the lead. It looks like we'll probably be reading Artemis Fowl. Um, but, like I said, I am leaving that open until, um, next Tuesday. Um, so that way, during my other streams, um, people can still vote. Um, I will be streaming again Thursday night. Uh, hopefully about 10, 10.30 p.m. Central Time. Um, and that's going to be more Mass Effect 3 that I've been, uh, working through. And, um, to keep updated on when that actually starts, there's, uh, I have social media, um, Twitter is pretty much the most reliable of those. Um, if you have missed out on some of this book, or, um, you know, if there's any parts that you missed, I do uh, upload the videos onto YouTube. So uh, that'll be available uh, pretty uh, as soon as uh, this one will be available as soon as I can get it uploaded. The previous um, uh, previous versions are, or not versions, previous uh, chapters, I guess, are uh, already up there. Um, and. So yeah, if you want to get the entire, uh, want to be able to hear the entire book, I think it's a total of six parts, um, counting this one here. Um, and those are all up on, on that YouTube. Uh, if you want to hang out and talk outside of stream, I do have a Discord, which, oops. There's the, uh, link to that Discord, and that's just a, a nice app that makes, uh, talking really easy and convenient. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoy it a lot. Um, and then... If you're looking for some awesome streamers, you should totally give uh, my fellow odd streamers a follow. It's uh, Storms of Pillow Fort Games, Rainy, Todd, and Boo. They're all super fantastic. Uh, it's the unofficial team known as the odd streamers. Uh, or optimistically delightful dorky streamers. Um, they're all super fantastic uh, and totally deserving of your follows. Uh, that's going to be it for tonight. I'm not doing a uh, raid. Um, so, uh, just uh, because it's a relaxing stream, I tend to not do raids. I'm going to switch to my closing. There we go. Um, but yeah, I hope you all uh, enjoyed uh, the story, had a nice, relaxing, peaceful time, and I will see you 
uh, again Thursday night or if you're one that's just interested in the uh, books I will be uh, reading a new book on next Wednesday I'm not sure of the time yet because I'm not sure what my schedule is for work if I'm gonna have to work Wednesday or not but we'll see I hope you all have a fantastic evening thank you so much everyone for uh, coming out and uh, listening to me read I hope you enjoyed and uh, you could have chosen to be anywhere tonight and you chose to hang out uh, with me and I appreciate that so much and love each and every one of you hope you all sleep well or have good days whatever uh, time zone it may be for you and I will see you next time bye